the uh, October 28th school committee meeting to order. Uh, tonight, uh, we will actually follow the agenda as, as presented in the packet tonight, so I won't go through that. Uh, in terms of uh, the start, so as, uh, I'd like to open it up for public public input for anything that's not on the agenda. Uh, seeing none, uh, is there a motion for a consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. Is there anything anyone would like removed? Yes. I'd like to remove the minutes or make some minor amendments to it. Why don't we make the amendments? Okay. Um, in the um, in the section about the middle school math pilot, um, you know, we had a public comment from I think it was Mrs. Downing, uh, referring to some concerns about the usability of one of the pilot tools. Um, and considering our previous experience with Math and Focus and its usability issues, I think that that's relevant enough to add to the minutes. Um, so something is simple. The microphones. Yeah. Sorry about that, Linda. Um, I was saying that there was a conversation during the um, the math pilot portion of the meeting that um, I believe it was Mrs. Downing who raised a concern about the usability of one of the tools. Um, so I was hoping we could just add a sentence to that effect, essentially that um, public, you know, member of the public, Marianne Downing, or I think that was her name. Um, raised a concern about the usability of one of the tools from a web perspective and that it was very clunky from a usability perspective. Um, I only raised that because that is kind of a lessons learned from the math and focus related pro process as well. Um, and I think as well, we, we, I raised a question or concern about the potential cost of any renewables mm -hmm. to go with one of those that um, should be, in my mind, put in there as well because cost and budget is one of our key focus items. Um, so those are the two in that section I was hoping we could we could add if anybody had any objections or additions. You're talking consumables, right? Consumables, yeah. Renewables, consumables, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Consumables is a better word. I like that word. Thank you. So we accept that as a friendly amendment? I just yes. have a question because I'm, I'm trying to revisit that meeting. I remembered a question about textbooks or having something in hand. I don't remember the clunky. Um, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, yeah. Sorry? I think that was a separate question altogether. I think the clunkiness was about the online piece. So we can go back and, and I mean, I don't remember exactly what was raised, but we can go back and, and review that. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, there was a question, and I mean, to, Dr. Dr. your point, there was a request to make sure that textbooks are available for students as well, mm -hmm. that it's not just only web materials, because the web materials are slow to load, they make you watch a video, you can't just read and, and go forward appropriately. That was the, the essence of the comment. I don't, we don't need to go word for word with it, but I was just trying to summarize the essence of it. Mm -hmm. But I agree with the request that we actually have textbooks to take home was part of the essence of the question as well. I would just ask that if that became part of the minutes, the answer to it would too. Sorry. That if if the discussion of the textbooks became part of it, their answer would also be part of it because they talked about how um, there aren't the appropriate textbooks right now and that they're using different materials. So I think it's important not to leave something like that hanging without an answer. Maybe that maybe we just need to go back and have that portion added then. That dialogue. Those were two separate conversations. One is the the fact that digits right now there are not enough books for the seventh grade students to take home. Yeah. The existing versus the new materials that presumably we're going to buy after we choose one of these pilot materials to have enough books so they can be taken home. So it's I can see where there's confusion there, but they were two separate conversations. Okay. Um, and then the other, I had one more item as well, the MCAS presentation material in particular. There were some questions raised that are not captured <coughs> in that section. Um, in particular, I know I raised one, and I think there was a couple others raised, but I know I raised one about the seven-year cohort disparity between Parker and Coolidge and making sure we look into that and understand the root causes, and I know our principals are already doing so, but that is a long-term trend. Um, 
long term trend that I don't think should be excluded from the minutes necessarily. Yes. I'm wondering if this minute should just be taken officially off of the consent agenda and worked on and come back rather than try to piecemeal from memory this. I'm sorry to make more work. <laughs> it's probably me making more work, so I'm sorry as well. Linda. So <laughs> we can pull the minutes and just yeah. vote on them in a, in a separate meeting. Yeah. So let's. Uh, so the motion is to approve the consent agenda uh, sub with the subtraction of the October 17th meeting minutes. Second. Or somebody has to make that. Are you making that? I'm making it. Second. Second, yeah. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you. Okay. Uh, reports. Actually, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so very quickly, one of the um, things that, that we've done is we've actually um, joined um, a SLD committee um, with Boston's Children's Hospital and some other um, surrounding communities to talk about independent evaluations, reports, and best practices. Um, and the other thing that has happened since I was here last week, we've had um, a great meeting with our curriculum department and our early childhood partners to talk about how we were going to come together. And we've also met with um, Austin Prep to talk about proportionate share. Great. Thank so. you. Great. I just yeah. have one quick update. Um, I'll just say I also have um, Jennifer Allard here today, too, just to. Um, we have one personnel item that we wanted to update the committee on that we will be discussing throughout the year when we do our quarterly updates as well as when we get into the budget process that we recently had turnover with, within the human resources department. We have been sharing a human resources position with the town. So we've been very fortunate to be sharing a position with the town. That individual left, his last day was last Friday, so we have been meeting with the human resources director and the town manager because we both have realized that the town and the schools are now at the point that we each need to increase our staffing. So um, as part of the process for this year, we will be looking to backfill a full-time position within the human resources and finance area or central office for this position. It was a 50-50 split with the town, but with some recent turnover we've had in our group as well as some maternity leaves, we've realized we have sort of a gap within our own group. So we're looking at funding sources for the current year, either through salary savings and other areas to do transfers within the budget for this year. And we are working with the town manager and then finance committee to look at funding sources for next year. So we just wanted to let the committee be aware of that because we will be moving forward within the next week to post this as a 1.0 position on the school side. So it will be a new expense for the schools. Historically, it's been funded on the town side. So the town's just going to do their own thing? Yes. Do we have an, a rough estimate of the net ad that we're talking about? We do. For next year, we're anticipating it'll be between fifty-five and 60000 is what we're anticipating based upon what we've seen for comparables for that position. So this year, depending when we fill it, it'll be less than that. Of that. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Mrs. Kelly, did you? Uh, sure. I uh, just wanted to announce that um, we are uh, in the middle of onboarding our new extended day and community education director. Um, and it will be Christopher Nelson, who is the former rec director, uh, it, or actually current rec director for two more weeks in Winchester, Winchet, town of Winchester. That's a huge um, and so he will be coming. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about him, um, he has led after school programming, summer programming, preschool program, 
programming in Winchester for 18 years, as well as student and adult classes on a wide range of topics. He also has a background in financials, so he does, um, like he, he's, he's finishing town meeting in Winchester, presenting on that budget uh, in his department and then starting here on the 18th. So we're super excited. Um, we, we met with the extended day team who are doing just such a yeoman's work with keeping everything going. Um, as you know, we've had great growth in our department. Um, we have been able to look at the uh, wait list and we, uh, through uh, Gail and the former director Sandy's support, we're in really good standing with that and we hope to even be in better standing. So we're excited about that um, and kind of looking at our team and looking at all the different roles that they play. Um, so I think it's a huge win for us. We're really excited. So thank you to um, uh, Dr. King and Mrs. Dowd and Dr. Darty and myself. Uh, we did interview some pretty stellar candidates. We had uh, a really tough decision on our plate. So um, we were very lucky to have a very painful decision of having too many really good people that uh, were very interested in the role and brought a wealth of experience. Um, so welcome to Chris. And th did that fall within the uh, the posting? It did. Yeah, yeah. financially, yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dari. I had a couple things. Um, so uh, last Monday, I believe, a week ago Monday, um, Dr. Doxer, <coughs> Mrs. Kelly, and I were at the Joshua Eaton School for the their um, United Nations. Uh, assembly, and it was it was a great experience. Uh, Eleanor Rauchi, who is the uh, music teacher at Joshua Eaton, uh, throughout her music classes during the year, had had taught all of the students in different languages, depending on the grade, um, the the Forever Jacques song. And so, kindergarten sang it in English, first grade sang it in French, um, second grade I believe was Spanish, and so on, all the way up to fifth grade. And so that, that in itself was impressive. Andrew. And then they did it in a medley, all the whole school, one grade at a time. Really so something. they started and then finished, and it was, it was beautifully done. Mm -hmm. So I just want to recognize the work that Mrs. Rauchi did um, to, to make that all happen. It was a very nice assembly um, that, that Josh Eaton had put on. And then the other thing I wanted to add is that um, <clears throat> Saturday um, I was – and I think Mrs. Kelly was there, Dr. Doxa was there, I think Mr. Wise was there, and, and others. Um, I was at the New England School Band Association um, competition that was held here at um, Reading Memorial High School. It's been several years now that Reading Memorial High School has hosted this competition. It's usually the last competition before the finals, which is, which is next week. Um, and so there were bands from all over the region that competed uh, on, our, on our Turf One football field. Um, and our high school band did a great job. I believe they came in second place in their division. So kudos to them. I also want to thank the band parents who, yeah. who organized this entire event. Um, it's a massive undertaking. It starts very early in the morning um, and goes um, to 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. So, Thank you. Mr. Wise. Dr. Doherty stole my Nesbitt thunder. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'll add is um, somewhat related is that I've had a parent or two, and uh, we can talk about this, I guess, at budget time, but I've had a parent or two reach out to me about the fact that their uniforms are 25 years old. Um, so I don't know, you know, if there's something we can renew there. I'm, I'm sure they've taken great care of them, but if we can figure out at some point in time if, this, if the committee agrees to, the, to go out and get some new band uniforms, 25 years seems kind of crazy for... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay, I didn't even see you there, so um, maybe we'll hear more from you later. Where else? No. Nothing yet. Huh? Nothing yet. <laughs> um, so I had a very exciting first meeting with RCTV, my first one with the group, and it was um, what a nice group of people. <laughs> and co wholly committed to what their, their mission is. Um, I wanted to say that um, they had board elections, and 
I'm now on the board, but um, there are three RMHS students on the board now that were voted in on the 24th. And they all um, were interested in film or in TV production. And they were reeled in by the teacher here, Anna Cuevas. Um, Cuevas. Cuevas. Um, so many thanks to Anna Cuevas. And um, so Michael McLaughlin, Alex Ferreira, and Bridget Scanlon were all voted onto the board. And they all had great questions and are going to bring a lot to the conversations that go on at a really pivotal time. And, uh, and I just felt my renewed gratitude to RCTV because I know that's how we're getting our message out there. So um, that was basically it. And I wanted to add one little caveat to the Joshua Eaton presentation that I wanted to mention that the third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders sang in Chinese, Russian, and Arabic. So, I mean, it was just incredible, the different languages. Those are the official languages of the UN, which is why they were chosen. And uh, it was just amazing to watch, as were the bands. Medco Parla. Hmm? Medco Parla. Do you want to just say about the Medco Parla? Oh, thank you. Yes, so on um, Saturday. on Saturday, yeah, sorry, I wasn't quite sure which thing you were talking about. We have other things going on, too. So the Friends of Reading Metco um, is having our dinner from 4 to 6 in Dorchester. I don't actually have the address in front of me, but it's online. It's went out with Mrs. Engelson's notice, I believe. Um, so please come. Um, it's a free dinner. It's potluck. Meat is being provided and vegetarian entrees. Um, and it's a great way to meet, to bring the two communities, Boston and Reading residents together so that we know each other and we build real authentic, is the word, relationships and can support each other and really follow through on the mission of METCO, which is to build one community here um, and, and have it be a diverse and rich community. So I hope people can come. It's still time to sign up. Now we uh, go into the early literacy. Yes. Uh, so Lisa Marie Ippolito was here um, to talk about the pilot screener that Joshua Eaton is doing this year as a result of a DESI grant that we applied for and received during the summer. So first of all, I want to thank Lisa Marie and her teachers for all the hard work that they've put into this project already and will continue to do so throughout the year. Thank you. Hi, um, so I'm just going to uh, introduce Lisa Marie. I know John just did too as well. Um, really late in the school year in June, uh, we had the opportunity to apply for two last minute early childhood grants. We actually applied for both of them. Um, one was to take place at another school and one was to put, take place at Eaton. Um, we didn't receive the other one, but we did receive this one. Um, and really, it was exciting for us because we want to be at the table with decisions being made, knowing that this screening process is now going to be required. Uh, and when I called Lisa Marie and actually the other principal as well for the other grant, they were super excited to be part of that. So kudos to our team that's always looking to enhance our work and really um, add to our wonderful programming. So I'm going to let Lisa Marie talk. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me back to school committee. It's always a pleasure to see everybody here. and share this um she has a cold so oh yeah i'm um, a little under the weather but we'll go. just go with it um so we are piloting as um, assistant superintendent kelly has stated the early literacy screener um, for dyslexia and who is involved in this program obviously the administration assistant superintendent kelly myself allison Stryker, who's our humanities coordinator all um, K2 teachers that are listed up there, as well as our reading specialist, Stacy Crest, and most importantly, that's why they're bold and red, are amazing, every single K-2 student at Joshua Eaton. Um, and so um, they've begun to take the assessment, so I'll just talk about the timeline a little bit and some background. So back in October 2018, uh, um, Department of Education from Massachusetts um, issued um, a ruling and guidelines um, 
around early dyslexia screening, um, although it's, as it states up there, it's based on neurological uh, learning disability, including but not limited to dyslexia. And then um, March 2019, um, they uh, sent reports of guidelines. Um, those were not really firmed <coughs> up at that point, but did discuss that there would be grant funding available for districts to pilot assessment tools. So we waited patiently and patiently to see what was going to come of that information from March. And then finally in May, uh, as Assistant Superintendent Kelly had stated, um, they put out um, the early dyslexia, uh, early literacy pilot screener, and the grant code obviously is 735. And so um, Assistant Superintendent Kelly and I, we talked about it. My staff and I had already been talking um, considerably about um, the dyslexia screener and the possibilities and it coming out even prior to the grant because we've been doing a lot of work um, as I've presented before around looking at student um, data and having that inform our instruction in a very methodical systematic way so um, we were excited for this opportunity so come June 2019 we applied for the grant um, and present day which uh, um, it says DESE reports uh, the guidelines are in development, but as of, I think it was last Thursday afternoon or Friday, they actually have made some decisions. Um, there's actually a meeting tomorrow at the Board of Education where they have um, communicated with a group I believe is called Pivot. Um, it's a group of educators and researchers who are looking at best practices of instruction and assessment around um, dyslexia. Um, and hopefully they're going to release some more information um, to the school districts, which we're very excited um, to hear more about. So then um, let's talk about the grant and the details around the grant. So basically the purpose is to find a high quality early literacy screener um, that you are able to use with all students, grades K to two, um, and that our, um, the onus is on us to provide feedback um, on the screener that we were assigned. Um, so Josh Wheaton, we, there were four choices of screeners and we were assigned um, a screener titled iStation. Um, what we've learned about iStation is that iStation is used across the state of Texas um, considerably. Um, and so our charge is to use the program as authentically as possible and then to provide feedback um, to the stakeholders around this grant. <clears throat> and how did we know that we got the grant? It was kind of exciting. A special envelope came um, and um, my name was on it and we received a letter <laughs> from Governor Baker as well as Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito congratulating Joshua Eaton um, on receiving the grant as well as a letter from um, the DOE um, letting us know about um, the screener that was chosen and some paperwork we needed to fill out and worked in conjunction with Assistant Superintendent Kelly to um, submit that paperwork. So then where are we at now? So we've already talked about June 2019. We applied for the grant, received it in 2000, August 2019. Um, in September, we had our initial professional development. So part of um, not just using this program because we never want to do anything blindly because uh, that doesn't make sense. But um, we have a full professional development scheduled already um, set up for the entire school year with um, iStation professionals. And they come in and work with my staff and I. We also have webinars with them. Um, and they are, have been very, very available to us even outside of the designated um, time slots to meet with them. So our first assessment was administered um, October 2019, which was earlier this month. And uh, we also had a second professional development where we actually looked at our student data from Joshua Eaton. Um, and they really spent, it was a whole day PD, they really worked with our st entire K2 staff and reading specialists to analyze that data and what does it mean and how would that guide our instruction. I have to say, I have to give kudos to my K2 t teaching staff because at the end of um, the professional development, they pulled me aside and they said, I have two things to say to you. First thing I wanna tell you that your staff is extremely knowledgeable around data-driven instruction. We had, didn't have to do a 101 with them, we were like a 103 with them in terms of their knowledge base. 
um, and they really knew their students. And they also felt like our results already yielded um, significant growth for our students where they typically see a uh, typical kindergarten, kindergarten, kindergarten group or first grade group or second grade group. So that was really encouraging to us that we, um, we know we're in the right direction. Our internal data shows that. Our external data also shows that. But it was really encouraging to hear um, that information from these professionals as well. Um, and so through this process, we will also be giving feedback um, to the state around our thoughts um, around this actual iStation program. Um, lastly, assessment administration. So this assessment is administered once a month, and it's supposed to be done the first of the month. Um, and so I was able to go in when several of the different classrooms at several different grade levels were administering because I wanted to see, okay, what does this actually look like in live action? Um, and I, I'm happy to say, um, including our kindergartners, they were able to, they're taking them on iPads. So they were able to log on to the iPads with their little card that has their username and password. They had the little headphones on and they just went with it. It was, it was actually incredible. A great piece about this tool also, it has a modeling component. So the teachers all did a whole class lesson modeling the assessment, like how you go in and what you'll see and the cute little characters. And um, so that really benefited our students and they did a very, very nice job. Um, the state plans on submitting, they haven't decided the frequency. I'm not here to really talk about the state's plans, but they're going to decide how often and who will receive the screener. That has not been determined yet. Um, we have reports for every single student, K to two. Like I said, we have data slash SST meetings um, each grade level every three weeks. And so we're using this data um, to continue to inform our instruction as well as our FNP data, AMC data, et cetera. Um, so that is just an overview of what's happening for Joshua Eaton um, around this screener. So, Lisa, thank you. Thank you. In terms of the, the uh, I think it was the slide that said background where it says they haven't produced the guidelines yet, they're in development. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm just confused. Are the guidelines gonna come from what's learned in the screening process? Or I mean, wouldn't the guidelines come out before we started spending the money? So I believe what they're talking about is like who's actually going to be assessed because right now they're having all K to two students assessed. I think that they're looking at will that still be what they put forth and how many times a year will students be assessed. So I know currently some of the guidelines say three times a year as we're doing monthly currently right now. Um, but I think it's encouraging to see that they've pulled together this group of experts um, that I said is meeting tomorrow. They're gonna talk more about that tomorrow to actually set the guidelines that are common across the state. So yes. uh, how many, dis do you know how many districts are doing this? They, it's in been interesting, they haven't really shared that. I know that uh, North Reading is also using iStation, but that's the only other district. The only other one that's in our cohort that's doing it is North Reading. Uh, a few other districts applied and didn't receive the grant. And I noticed on the letter we redacted the amount of I the, did. how much was the grant for? Yeah, it was 5,900. Yes. And that was just, I'm sorry, just to clarify, and that was just for the licensure of the program. That Thanks. Um, so thank you for this. I, you just said you're not here to talk about what the state's gonna do, but I'm gonna ask you to read okay. tea leaves anyway. <laughs> um, so it doesn't sound to me like this is gonna yield this is the tool that everyone in Massachusetts, it's gonna be more like a list of tools. So you sort of already answered this, but I would imagine when we get to that point where it's mandated and we've got the list of potential tools, it would be really helpful to talk to some of those other districts and say, you know, if, if you absolutely love this tool and it's on the final list, I guess it's, that's a no-brainer, but I'd be really interested to get some even informal feedback from the other districts. So even if that's not possible right now, it might be an interesting conversation to put in Desi's ear that Give, give all the piloters a chance to talk together would be great. That would be exciting um, because one of the other tools they use is Lexia, which um, it's Lexia Rapid Assessment. So we use Lexia at Joshua Eaton as like the, the program itself. So it's exciting to us because we love Lexia and what it does for our students. So 
um, I don't know if you want to say any more, but so they've been I, really kind of tight lipped. Yeah, they've been very tight lipped. <laughs> they have four programs that they're piloting across the state. Mm -hmm. Lexi is one of them, MAP is another one. And what's the fourth Star one? Star Early, Early Literacy. Literacy. Mm -hmm. We did not know iStation, is, as um, Lisa Marie said, it's a Texas tool. We weren't familiar with it. Um, we do know that it won't be monthly, and we don't think it'll be K-1-2. Uh, the state had certain parameters around it, so we yeah. have to do all K-1 and 2. I, I think, I wonder if they're still deciding if K is the perfect grade for it. They've been very tight-lipped around Very. Okay. We're hoping that they will publish, I mean, this whole curate process of having a bank that has, like, real-time real, real -time information on things, that's what they're telling us, is that there's, so we will most likely have assessment tools and they will be assessing how, like, how usable was this, how was their PD, how was their that. Okay. They're not really allowed to recommend vendors, but sure. I think that they're looking at that whole curate process mm -hmm. of Good. like, if you're a district and you're looking, we have these new guidelines, these are the tools that have been assessed by your peers. And I, I would imagine they'll publish that at some point. Right. They just haven't yet. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. So I think some of this has already been answered, but I was just wondering, you know, it says in the materials here, the grant details, it says that we're allowed to choose or provide a request of which one we'd like to choose. And I think you just said iStation we didn't even know about, so that obviously wasn't one we requested. Right. We requested Lexia. You requested Lexia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to put on, you had to name all four of them in the in order, order that you wanted them, but okay. they got to choose. Okay. We went with the one we knew <laughs> first. Okay. Um, good. Another question, I guess, it's more, maybe it's more for Ms. Kelly, maybe it's more for Ms. Stice, maybe it's more for Dr. Doherty. Um, dyslexia as itself is a recognized disability, um, including the statement by the federal government in 2016 that it can go on IEPs and things along those lines. Why aren't we treating this like a child fine thing? Why is it a pilot in one school, which I appreciate we're, we're for, forerunners in that regard, but why aren't we treating it more in a child find based model where we're looking for anybody who could fit the criteria? So I think that is eventually the goal of the state that they know from the research from like Dr. Wolf and, and Dr. Orkin that there are markers that you can tell before students even begin reading if they may struggle. And so the goal of, of this whole survey is to start to begin to develop a tool where we can start putting in interventions at the general education level as soon as possible to hopefully avoid students who then need to go through the IEP eligibility process because although they may have markers and they may have this disability, we've already provided some um, interventions. So the, that is the goal to get there, and we have to work within the framework of the grant around how is the state going to roll this out. Um, so I think we want to get to that point. Okay, so just a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Um, the DSE published in, on October 19th a reminder that we are supposed to be doing this for all of our students regardless of whether the pilot's going on or not. It says the DSE reminds districts that your current screening processes should continue, as well as work on developing and implementing procedures and protocols pertaining to suspected reading disabilities and or dyslexia. So I think what they were saying, I know Mrs. Stewart was at those meetings with DSE in the spring. What they were saying is because they really haven't solidified what tools we should be using, what grades, what timelines that they're encouraging slash expecting, yep. that we should use the current tools that we currently use currently we use. So we do, we do F&P benchmarking as well as K-1 um, early screeners. That's part of what we do as part of our protocol. We also screen all our, our new kindergarten kids. Do we do it specifically for like this criteria? No. So what that statement is, is use what you're currently using for your early screener materials and know that there's more to come. That's how Mrs. Stewart uh, had talked to us about it last yeah. spring. I, I would agree with that and I do think that the the piece is that we also are more keenly aware as all of this research has come out we're very specifically looking at some of the, even some of our curriculum measures when we're looking at preschool and kindergarten students are they able to rhyme are they able to remove 
um, one letter and still say the rest of the word. And if they are struggling to do that as part of our child find obligations, obviously we start right away looking at, at measures to ensure that they're gonna be successful. Dr. Doxer, I, I'll get you in a second. Um, thank you for taking the initiative to look sure. for these ways to be involved in the rules that are made. I know that that has helped our district in many ways over the years, being part of the formation of the tools that come here. Um, two questions one is whether the grant covers like you said a full day of PD does it cover the substitute teachers and the support for the teachers when they have to leave their classroom no we've been and very creative let's just say we've been very creative and the second question is um, it, if it wasn't, I was coming with the same question Mr. Wise had, it wasn't the one that you chose. Are you finding that the teachers feel it's still a positive tool to use with our students? Like it's not spinning wheels and fulfilling a grant. Is it still a helpful excellent assessment question. tool? Yeah, excellent question. So I think at first, um, so like I said, my staff knew we were headed in some direction. We were kind of investigating even prior to like the grant coming out, like additional tiered interventions to use. Um, and so they all had to agree to do this for us to actually receive the grant. So that's step one. Mm -hmm. Step two is, of course, you know, I wouldn't say apprehend apprehension, um, but of course, it's nervousness with anything new. But once the teachers gave the assessment and we went all the way through it, because of course you're you're. You're nervous about technology, you're nervous about what does this actually entail, like all those pieces that come with it, and most importantly, you're nervous about the kids, like is this gonna stress them out, or are they gonna be too tired? Um, but we happily found was that, um, like I said, the, the children took the assessment, they did really, really well with it, they were very proud of themselves, and then particularly, especially after the professional development that we had, all together, the teachers were excited, and many have said to me, I can't wait for Friday, because Friday the new window opens for the next round of assessment, like to compare and contrast, like, oh, let's see how the kids have done. Um, and so they have some really thorough reports that come with iStation, um, that's exciting to us as well. Um, we love, we just love using <coughs> data to kind of inform, like, what, or what we're seeing, does it match what's on the assessment data, so. Can you just follow up? You were saying it adds, data that they're very excited about mm -hmm. having um, is that d the data crunching is that taking a lot of time for them too or does the tool do that the data tool crunching does for them? absolutely everything but we take the human side right and we take those data reports and we actually talk about the children behind those numbers and we're saying oh that was a surprise or oh no that didn't surprise me at all that was really you know great or oh let's look at this a little further but let's pull all the historical data because um, you know we like I've been here many times to present, and we've been tracking data for the three years I've been there, and so we're looking at like the big pictures um, of, of students. Thank so, you. yeah, thank you. Mrs. Bennett, did you? Do you mind going up to the to the mic so it gets on? I'll move out of your way. <laughs> Reiterate what Tom said about um, early screening, and of how the bill said that we should be already be doing this. And um, you brought up F and P, which is not appropriate for special ed. Um, so this is a problem I see. Um, and I just want to point out that um, iStation has been used up in other uh, states so far. North Carolina has been using it for a couple of years. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, research on that with them. And they say that there are two missing key components per I uh, station, which is rapid automatic naming and phonemic awareness, which is what distinguishes a dyslexic from a regular SLD. So um, you really have to pay attention to what, before you get too deeply into using this tool or spend too much money, that it's really appropriate to find the dyslexic. Um, they've also said, I've been reading articles that they've um, questioned the validity of it because they seem that it's easy because you, you have the gaming component of it and it's not really, I mean if you think about it, P 
people, you know, teachers talk to these kids and they sound out words for them and they, you know, try to get them to read and they, it's really interactive between, that's the best way to assess this. And this is all done online. There's, there's not that interaction. Um, so I did read a lot about, the, they, they were questioning the validity of it. They found that some of their kids were um, doing well on this, but then at year end, they found that they were, they were failing. So I, um, I think it would be beneficial if you, um, you know, ask professionals in the field what they thought, rather than the companies pushing the software. Um, Dr. Gav or, or anybody else you could reach out to. Um, I took a few minutes to talk to Nancy Duggan, and she had she said the same thing about the two missing components. Um, so I'd hate to see you um, really get deeply into this and have it be a failure when we should have already been screening for this well over a year ago, and now we're, we're a little late to the game, and I am concerned about just doing Joshua Eaton. I don't know why. I mean, I understand, but it seems like you have low referrals for LLD, um, so you're missing a lot, missing, a lot of kids are missing out. I know my son was not screened uh, appropriately, and still using FMP, which is just not, should not be used on this bed. Um, it's just not an indicator of anything. It just shows your child how much you've memorized words. There's no decoding, no elements. Um, so I would just really caution you before you spend a lot of money on it. And um, these kids need to be screened appropriately. And uh, I, I question the appropriateness of iStation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just as a response to that, um, we don't have any loyalties to iStation at all. The state asked us to uh, look at this product. Um, as the state gives us more guidelines, we're going to be looking at any and all and, and talking to folks. We know that we want to have a screener that works, and we also, you're right, there's a big cost involved in this too. So we're looking at all of it. It doesn't mean that we won't use it, um, and we'll definitely bring up some of the concerns that you shared um, if it's missing components. We, we knew nothing about it when we got it, and they fully say that they're a Texas, primarily a Texas mm -hmm. company. Um, we were asked to give honest feedback on the tool. The state is most likely going to give feedback on all four tools and probably rate them in order. So um, that's where we're left. Dr. Dobbs. Um, did I hear right that this is not the only tool that's being used right now to screen our kids at Joshua Eaton, that there are other ways mm -hmm. that you're finding out information. So mm -hmm. all the eggs aren't in just this basket. Right. Our learning comes from our everyday work with students, and I'm just gonna be honest, not, the screener kind of gives us a result where we actually look and we say, hmm, that's surprising. No, that's not surprising. If it's surprising, let's investigate further. So we're using many diff different data points every single day. Lots of formative assessments happen in our classrooms. Um, so. Did you have something? Yeah, as, as far as the product itself, is it delivering any data points that we aren't already looking at? Um, they, yeah, I, w I would say so. We haven't, so just remember, like, this is like month one. Yep. Um, so we've looked at more of the general reports. We have a professional development coming up in two weeks where they're taking us into the deeper dive of various reports. Um, and so we were just excited about that to, to see those differences. Mr. Wise. Um, one of the other mentions or one of the other things that comes with early screening is family history. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I, as far as I've seen on the website for iStation, it doesn't ask those questions. So are we adding that to the feedback here or is there any other way that we're gathering other information that are known markers with regards to dyslexia? Mm -hmm. So when we have a concern with a student, they go through the SST process and that, through that process, the, whoever's referring the child does call the families and gathers in that kind of historical information, anything we should know, uh, regardless whether it's dyslexia or, or another, um, various t different kind of learning disability. And so then when we come to the table, we're really accurate about talking about what interventions do we think would benefit this individual child. So in terms of iStation themselves, the students are taking the assessment. Um, 
and again, um, we're just giving feedback of what they're asking us to give feedback, and we're prepared, because um, I also want to state that we're obviously a group of professionals um, and understand the, the markers for dyslexia uh, and language-based learning disabilities, as we do have that program at Joshua Eaton. Um, and so we're ready to kind of have those conversations uh, when the time is, the time is right. In terms of this particular, in terms of this particular tool and the training that you've gone through and the PD related stuff, have they s laid out? You know, if you see they score this on comprehension, they score this on phonemic awareness, they score this on, then it's likely dyslexia. Have they laid out some sort of rubric or anything else in terms of all the data they collect that would show? hey, this is an assessment, this is a valid screener, mm -hmm. here's what a dyslexic student might look like? Mm -hmm. They have not, but our staff has like asked those questions, and so we're, we're kind of doing our own kind of tiered work. Um, and I'm hoping that we're gonna get there, because that's definitely, like you said, we don't wanna be spinning our wheels. It, the, the program itself, like I said, we didn't have a choice um, on the one that we selected, but I will say that it does cover a significant amount of the touch marks for um, dyslexia. Yes, sorry. I do think that um, part of what the state is trying to do with this screening, the screening is the first step. After that, it's some of those instructional components to make sure we are actually doing all of the right things. So the screener is literally just that to help us identify students, and then the state's really trying to make sure there are then systems in place for students that may have some of those markers that we need to be aware of. And then on the special education side, in terms of if there was a referral made to special education, we've been doing a lot of work around the Dr. Arkin's protocol around what, what is a struggling reader. And so if you give these certain assessments, this is a comprehension issue, this is a naming speed issue, this is a double deficit issue, and here are programs that then make sense. So that as we are gathering the data from schools that are concerned, we're then able to use it to do a deeper dive into the eligibility process and, and make sure we're um, providing the right information as we go through that process. Which is very separate from the screener, but just that kind of tiered level of figuring out an issue and then uh, providing the correct response in order for students to make progress so that we're really targeted. And I think that's the goal of the screener through general education and then when it gets to the special education level, making sure we're matching the right programs for the right students. I like how you said that, if I can just add to that too. So sometimes when we're talking about it, we think about when we bring students to the nurse's office to have like their hearing and vision checked, that's a screener. And when we flag something and say, oh, there could be a problem here, we send them to their pediatrician or to a tier two doctor, a neuro ophthalmologist, for example, to investigate further. So I kind of equate it to that, like this is the screener so that um, we're looking at students and those hallmarks, and then if there something is gleaned from the screener, what are we doing? What are we doing about that? What's the next action step? Yes. I would 100% agree with that summary right there. I mean, I think that's exactly the point, and I think that's also the, some of the concern that you're hearing, at least from my voice, mm -hmm. and you're hearing in the audience with regards to this, this particular tool. And, you know, we're somewhat no choice, no problem, because we weren't selecting the tool, it was selected for us. But in terms of our feedback, you know, your collective expertise needs to go into whether or not this tool is appropriate as a screener. It does seem extremely strong from the reports I've read, all the material I've read about general ed. It seems like it adds a lot of augmentation, a lot of, you know, home school relationship related work. It adds a lot of extra practice work. It adds all sorts of other stuff in there from a general ed perspective. And so we might want to have a conversation about that at some point in time, but I think it's, from, from everything I've studied, it does not seem appropriate. And that's not your fault, right? right? No. <laughs> um, as, as, a, as a screener, right? I mean, a screener, like you say, is, is it's a quick test. You go there, yeah. beep, 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 can I hear, you know, this is not a quick test if you're executing it every month, you know, 30 minutes and you're putting kids in iPads and things like that. So again, not your fault 
Right. Uh, Mrs. Apolito at all, not your fault, Mrs. Kelly. Nobody's fault necessarily, right. no it's just fault. the general feedback. Just part of the conversation, which yeah. is so exciting to us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and, I, and I'm, I'm, I love the fact that you're saying the kids liked it. I love the fact that you're saying the teachers are so engaged and they're seeing measurements in other ways mm -hmm. from a gen ed perspective. I think that's phenomenal. Um, I just wonder about the applicability, and that's, again, not your fault. 100%. Yes. I also think that this allows us to have a seat at the table as the state is mm -hmm. giving some more feedback because they pick these four tools. So if there are concerns about the tools, we now have a valid voice in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is all really good information for us. We are going to be demanding to be at a state meeting about this. <laughs> yes, we are. So we will definitely be part of the conversation. One Mrs. more. Mrs. Williams. One more request, I guess. Um, and that's actually in response to you, Mrs. Stice. We've heard about Dr. Orkin and her materials. From my recollection and all the meetings I've been in, including some last year, I don't think we've ever been presented on her actual findings and what those tiers are and how we get there and all that kind of fun stuff. I'm sure we have records that we can present or maybe we can even ask for a follow-up meeting to present that because I know there's a significant portion of the community that's very interested in that. So Mr. Robinson, if we can get it on the schedule, Dr. Doherty, somehow, some way. I think if anybody else is interested, I think we, we might want to hear more about that as well. Maybe that aligns to other things. Yep. Mrs. Williams. I'm really excited about this, but um, I think it's great whatever we can do to screen. The only thing that I will say to the committee is that if you haven't already, Google, use the word iStation, Google review, and you know make your own decisions. I know that we didn't really have a choice in the matter. A um, couple questions I had. What happens when the grant is gone? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so when the grant goes, the program goes. Um, we are obviously, hopefully, going to have some feedback after tomorrow's meeting to know which direction the state's going as far as how often, what's the frequency, uh, what grade, so that we'll be making budgetary decisions based on that. Um, this particular program is K-1-2. We've already been told from the date the state that they're not recommending a three grade screener. Um, the original recommendation was in kindergarten. I did hear that that may be pushed up to first or second grade, which is why they're piloting all three grades. But no, this, this contract, the grant pays for the subscription for the year at Eaton K to two. So what, when the grant, when that's done, it's done. So come June 30th, it's done. It's done? Yeah. Okay. So that kind of segues into my next question. You had said it was $5,900 for the license only. Yeah. What other costs came with that? And are those coming out of the building budget? Are they coming out of the gen ed sped budget? Um, did we have to buy more iPads? Did we have to buy new computers? Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. Um, so it was cost neutral for us. They provide the professional development for free. Um, yeah, so there's no there's no additional cost for us. We Joshua Eaton already had it um, scheduled prior to the grant. Um, we're trying to integrate a lot of tech integration into our school, so we did um, purchase 80 new iPads last year. But that was already something that we were going to do because um, we love our technology. The kids use it considerably in the classrooms, and um, so we just want to give them an opportunity for that global learning piece. Any other questions? I guess I'm the yes. PD. Um, so I'm the, so um, in terms of PD being cost neutral, it was the, their, they provide the instruction, but it came out of time you already had set aside, like half Great day question. release days or something like that mm -hmm. that were planned. Great question. So um, the way I strategically planned it is that most of the professional development happens during already scheduled professional development days or staff meeting days. There was just one day that um, which became extremely strategic and we got um, all of our staff covered, but um, try to be mindful of that because the mm -hmm. teachers have a lot on their plate and you know I'm just excited that they are so willing to participate and didn't want to ask for more time out of the classroom. One more point, I guess, and we may have other conversations, not so much around iStation, but uh, Ms. Kelly, around, around the whether we will screen at K, one, two, three. Um, the state may provide like a minimum viable product, I guess. You must do this. Um, research has shown you can discover this in pre-K. Relatively straightforward. 
Um, so just because the state provides a minimum, if we want to be Reading, we want to be really good at what we are, which we are, I would suggest we, we talk about some of the, the minimum screening that can happen in a pre-K. Whether it's, again, family history, whether it's alphabetic awareness, you know, phonemic awareness, rapid, you know, uh, automatic naming, as the case may be, some of those can happen in a five-minute conversation with a child um, per some of the experts in this space. So that's, I'd like to So that's think fortuitous about that you ask that. Um, that's part of our sort of long-term plan. That's why Dr. Stice and uh, Kelly Boswick and I met with all the preschool directors in town. We're starting to build a collaborate we're calling it our preschool collaborative, um, and we're really trying to have conversations around best practice, about common assessments, about screening, and all of that. And frankly, those conversations haven't really happened in the past. We don't have all the preschoolers in town, as you know. Um, and we are, we're lucky in Reading that we have some really talented preschool educators that are as committed to kids as we are. In the end, we get them all in kindergarten. So uh, we had our first meeting. We're going to have more meetings. We, we st already started the conversation about screening, about child fine, about um, using the same assessment tool, and maybe even bringing in a few different types of assessment tools, screeners, not necessarily for dyslexia, but just in general. One of which, like, I, that I'm familiar with is the gold tool assessment, um, which is a pretty universal Cadillac uh, assessment tool for, for pre-K. Um, we use a different one here, which is also very good. Um, we've had great luck with our teapot assessments that we're using, and those are the kind of things that we'd like to bring to the other educators in town. So we're really excited about it. Honestly, we didn't do it under this lens. We just do, did it under w these kindergartners coming to us. They come from all kinds of backgrounds, and shouldn't we be working alongside with our uh, community partners? And w our first meeting was awesome, and they're excited. We're going to be trying to collaborate professional development with them as well. So I, I think, Jen, I don't know if you have anything more to add about that, but super exciting. Yeah, it was very exciting. And not only did we talk about everything that um, Chris just mentioned, but we also talked about how do we really make sure that we're doing screenings under our child find and that they're accessible to all the community. And we started talking about inviting them all to the CPAC meeting, talking to doctor's offices to get out the screening dates. So really, truly a community partnership to make sure we're supporting all of our learners. And it's, it's really good work that's happening. Great, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I feel better. We have the uh, district and superintendent goals. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to walk you through this segment of the packet so that there, there's multiple parts here. The first piece is a combination district improvement plan and educator plan, which is the superintendent's uh, annual goals. So that's the first section in the packet. Um, the next section of the packet is uh, the superintendent's rubric. And the reason why I put it in this year is that this is a, a pilot rubric um, from previous years. So one of the decisions that the committee needs to make um, is whether or not they want to go with the pilot rubric or they want to continue with the current rubric that you've used in the past years. This rubric here, I was, I was part of the committee that um, modified, modified the, the rubric. This now aligns with the new teacher rubric because there is a teacher rubric that's that's been modified and a new principal rubric. Um, we have not started using those two tools yet, um, but where we will be moving forward in the future with those two tools, it would be advantageous for me to model the process with the, 
the new rubric this year um, for next year for the teachers and the, uh, the principals. Um, what has changed with the new rubric is that they've tightened up the language, they've eliminated some of the redundancy, they've made some of the elements more specific, and they've added, um, they've subtracted some indicators and they've added um, a couple of indicators. So that really is the, the main difference. The other piece in here is the, um, the PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to go through um, and talk about the superintendent evaluation system and then go into a little bit more detail with the, um, the district improvement plan and, and the, the annual goals. So that's, that's an overview of what's, what's, in, your, what's in your packet. <clears throat> So, for those of you that have been on the committee, this, this should look familiar to you. This is the five-step process, um, which all educators, licensed educators in the Commonwealth use. Um, so, teachers are going through this, principals, district administrators. The one exception is the superintendent's process is all done in public, um, whereas all of the other uh, steps in the process for other ed licensed educators is not. So you start with the self-assessment process, um, then you go through an analysis, goal setting, plan development, then you actually implement, once it's approved, you implement the plan. Um, then there's a midpoint check-in, um, and then the end of the year summative evaluation. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail in each one. So the first one, the first step is the um, self-assessment. So I have been doing a self-assessment. I've been using the new rubric, uh, going through that, identifying the areas um, that I feel, you know, I need to work on as a, as a superintendent, um, and then using a lot of the, the feedback that I received last year from the, the committee, um, which actually wasn't that long ago, it was a couple, it was a month ago, right, that we did the evaluation. Um, so I'm moving forward with this piece as I was developing my goals. Um, and what I want to focus on. They do recommend identifying six to eight indicators. Um, that's entirely up to the committee. I would not say that I'm going to be doing anything differently because I treat all of the indicators the same way, but if the committee wants to, to have me just focus on six to eight, that's, that's entirely up to, to you as a committee on how you want to handle that. Um, do you want us to ask questions as you go, or do you want us to wait whatever, till the end? Whatever works for you. Go ahead. I, mean, I, I think when we, we talked about the new plan a little bit earlier this year as well, um, the, the new assessment model. And yes. One of the pros I thought I heard at the time, and I'd like to hear your feedback on it now if possible, is that the, the, the focused items, the six to eight, allows the committee and yourself, not that you're going to change your operating process necessarily, but to really focus the uh, review process on those particular items. The review process as it is, looking across all of those is quite arduous and looking at every single item is very, 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 very long. So while it may not change your operating process, it might focus your review a little bit more. Would that be a fair summary of of the difference here and, and why there was a change in suggestion? You as a committee would still um, rate me on all of the indicators. So you would not, that's what makes this, I, I know they've recommended that, but it, it's, it's a little awkward when you, when you're gonna be still, you're gonna still be evaluated in all of the uh, indicators. I may not be using the right word because um, there's so many different steps and levels of all mm -hmm. that all that process. Um, but I remember, and maybe Mr. Parks, you might remember during your training as well, at, at the MASC training, they specifically said, well, you will rate them, each of those categories, the, like the five categories, each has like three or four sub-elements underneath them. Right? There's the standards, there's four of the standards, and then you have indicators. Yep, and then and under then the indicators, the elements. the elements, right? Yeah. So under the indicators, the elements themselves 
picking which of those elements to look at. So you're saying the indicators we should pick six or eight, or the recommendation is to pick six, six or eight, not elements themselves. Not the elements, no, six or eight indicators. Okay, I thought I had heard from. And they said two, preferably two from each standard. Preferably two from each standard. Okay, I thought I had heard it was elements, but maybe I misremembered. Re so I apologize. So go ahead. So. At the outset, you said that we have to vote on the you rubric. You have to vote on whether or not we're going to pilot the new rubric. But you, and then you said that you're already using it, so. No, I used it as a self-assessment, for my own self-assessment. Okay. There aren't a lot of differences between the two other than they've tightened up the language, they've eliminated the redundancy, um, they've actually eliminated some of the indicators, they've added uh, one or two indicators. Yes. I just, I just wanted to respectfully suggest that we let Dr. Darty go through his presentation because I suspect he's got some answers planned in. And so um, I mark on my pages when I have a question so I can go back to them. But I sort of feel it's hard if he's got plans to talk about things to then ask him questions at any of our staff. Actually, this is a feeling I have when we have presentations, truth be known, that they are planning to talk about things and we don't know what they're planning to talk about in full until well, they the do Well, the questions were about the, the beginning of the presentation, though. We weren't, I don't think any of them were jumping ahead, but that's fine. We can wait until the end. I'm happy to wait. I'm fine either way. Sorry, just <laughs> the second step um, is actually what's happening tonight. So uh, this is the goal setting piece, the plan development piece. Um, as part of this, there's, there's really two parts. One is the district improvement plan part, and the other part is the, the superintendent's annual plan, which are the, the individual goals uh, that I have as superintendent. Um, throughout the rest of the year, once the goals are approved, then there, you have step three, which is the implementation of the plan and the collection of evidence. And for all of you, except for, for Pat, who wasn't here last year, you get, you do get a large amount of evidence um, as part of the evaluation process um, that is connected to the different standards and, and goals. Step four is a mid-year piece. So at the mid-year, uh, I report on the progress of the goals um, at a meeting. Usually that's done in the February time frame. And then at that point, the committee can provide feedback. And then step five is the summative piece um, which uh, normally happens towards the end of the school year. So I can stop there and answer any questions on this piece, if that makes sense. Um, so my instinct, this is maybe a question. Actually, did you want to more deliberate at the end of all of this? No, go ahead. Okay. Just, uh, um, I think that if we're moving in the direction of a different teacher and principal rubric and this is aligned to it, I think that's a compelling argument to move in this direction. Um, I agree with you from looking at it. It doesn't seem strikingly different, mm -hmm. but in, to the extent that it is different, it's a little better. So I, I would be comfortable moving in this direction. As far as the focusing on the, the what was it, six to eight focus goals? The, uh, the indicators. I see both sides of it. I can see the argument that it focuses all of us in the review process. The downside of it to me is if we've all agreed these are the eight that we're going to focus on, I would be worried that things happen over the course of the year that rise as really important that need to be recognized in your review. But if it wasn't one of the eight we predetermined, I, I don't like that. I, I, my inclination would be not to limit it. If we're going to do it anyway, it allows actually the committee, we're a little bit more empowered to say this happened and if it was a wonderful thing or a not wonderful thing, it allows us to highlight truthfully what happened at, throughout the year. So that's just my take on both of those questions that are before the committee. Mr. Park. The other thing I'm looking at is, is the mid-cycle feedback. I'd actually like to see it a little more frequently as far as at least three feedback sessions because we're, ch we're, we're looking at a, a chunk of time each time to review this. I'd rather see it three times and that way we see progression going throughout the calendar year or the school year rather. Just um, on the, first of all, on the using the new guide. Um, 
some feedback I've heard from some teachers is we are so fast to move in some of these cases that we're like years ahead of other districts, which is a good thing, but also a very challenging thing um, in that regard. Uh, and so I'm wondering if we really need to force ourselves into the first year or whether or not it makes sense to let some of the kinks get worked out by somebody else the first year. Um, and if we go as a superintendent and teacher slash principal in, in unison, whether we stay or go, unison is good, but jumping in to the water initially seems, I'm a little hesitant about that. So if I can answer that. Actually, we're two years behind on the teacher one. The teacher one was developed two years ago. There are districts that have been using it for two years. The superintendent one was the last one of the three, and that happened this summer. That was finished this summer. The principal rubric has been around for one year. The teacher one has been around for two years. Okay. So in essence, we're behind with the teacher rubric. Okay. And my other thought, um, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Not, not aligned to other points, but um, not surprising. But anyway, my other thought is that the six to eight indicators um, doesn't limit us from providing feedback on something else that's great, that's important, right? It's just a guideline. It's, it's your, these are the items that you really want to say. These are the ones that are, we believe are most importantly aligned to the other goals. It doesn't say you can't take the other, I don't think, as far as I read it and understand, you can't review the other items at all. It's just saying these are the ones that, are, that, are, that we believe are most directly aligned to the goals as they're outlined. Um, so it doesn't limit us from saying, yeah, you did really great in this thing or you really messed up in that thing, as the case may be. I don't think that's a, a limiter. Yeah, um, I would, the only thing I would add to that, I'd have more concerns about being an early adopter if this was radically different than what we were using before. But it just doesn't strike me as radically different. I, I actually, I agree with I you. I you wanted to wait until the end. <laughs> <laughs> this was the question time, Mr. Yeah. Robinson. <laughs> um, I, I agree that it's not radically different, but the ways, and I agree that the ways I found it was different were helpful ones, that some of the wording that they use differentiated, like whether you're supporting or whether you're empowering. That was some of the nuance and the difference of the languages of the indicators, and I thought that that was actually very helpful to decide, you know, with the last uh, assessment pro evaluation process, it wasn't always clear, like, how do you cross this line? How do you figure out which he's doing? And I thought this language was helpful. Um, about the um, limiting of how many we're looking at, I sort of felt like we'd been giving the message that we wanted more smart goals, we wanted more measurable ones, and that they needed to be tailored in, and the footnote that's at the beginning of this says that's what we're supposed to be doing. And I, I agree that I don't think it means that we can't say things about that are, uh, we can't refer to things in the district improvement plan. But the things that we're scrutinizing the most closely, I mean it narrows in and focuses our evaluation on what we, we know he's spending the most time on it. I think that the other, the other important data is going to come out from that as well. I mean, if he's focusing in on the data, we're going to see how, I don't mean to keep referring to you as he, but we'll see how Dr. Doherty is supporting or empowering teachers to do, and administrators to do the work. Um, so I was, um, I actually thought that in his first um, standard adopting the whole district improvement plan within his first standard of instructional leadership, that that was a lot to bite off um, that's going to come back directly <coughs> at him, which he is responsible for anyways because he's responsible for the district. But I thought focusing in would be helpful for us as well as being more fair in the evaluation. So in terms of, of deciding on a, we, I'm sorry, we just, no, no, go. in terms of it's deciding on the <laughs> rubric, uh, so when we say six to eight, so we're gonna go to like indicator one and pick 
two or three of those because there's six of them under so six sections under indicator one. Yeah, one. Is, I that think, what, is that I think what we mean when we say we pick six? That. Is that what we mean when we say we pick six to eight? We pick and choose. So you have a couple of decisions. For the first decision is whether or not you're going to use the new rubric. Right. But um, the second decision is if you're going to streamline it to eight, I would recommend to you the eight that would make the most sense. That doesn't mean you have to accept those eight. You can change them. Um, it's supposed to be aligned with the goals and the district improvement plan, the eight indicators that are chosen. They recommend you do two per standard. It doesn't have to be, but that's what they recommend. But there's nothing that says we can't use them all, right? No, there's nothing yeah. that's it. No, you can use them all. Okay, I misunderstood. Anyone else? Okay. okay. So in the rubric piece, I, I thought it was important to highlight <coughs> the next three slides in terms of what the priorities of a district leader is supposed to be. Um, the first one is to ensure that you have alignment. One of the reasons why um, the rubrics are designed the way they are is because it shows alignment between the teacher rubric, the administrator rubric, the district administrator rubric. Um, if you had copies of the other two, you could see what I was talking about. Um, but there is an alignment. There is what is called coherence so that everyone is rowing in the same direction. We do the same thing with our plans. So the district improvement plan is the umbrella. The school improvement plans um, are based on the, the umbrella areas of the district improvement plan. Teachers and administrators focus their goals on their school improvement plans, which are aligned to the district improvement plan. By doing that, you can align your resources more effectively. You can um, all be rowing in the same direction on different areas. So that's what the coherence in the alignment piece mean. The other piece is empowering principals and other district administrators um, to trust the experts in the different areas and to allow them to do the work that needs to be done. Um, so that's, that's really the highest form of leadership is when you empower others to do the work they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then the third is leading with a commitment to equity, making sure that we are creating the most inclusive classrooms that we possibly can um, for, for all of our students in the in the school district. So those are the three priorities of a district leader and they are, they are outlined here. Here is a snapshot of the, uh, of the rubric. So the four standards are at the top um, and then you have below each standard, the red are the indicators and then under the indicators are your elements. Um, the one big change that you should be aware of is um, standard uh, 1F down below there, Roman numeral F, the student learning indicator. So there is now an actual indicator for student learning. That did not exist in the past. There is also a similar indicator in the teacher rubric and in the principal rubric. Um, so that is a big change. Um, there's, been, there's other minor changes and the wording has changed a little bit in the actual elements, but that's, that's probably the biggest addition to the rubric from the, the current one. So I don't know if there was any questions on that piece because I'm going to move on to the district improvement. So if you can go back to that uh, under, sure. the, under the <coughs> student learning indicator, how come there's no... Uh, it doesn't have an element. Okay. It doesn't have its own element. So when you look at the rubric, it's really based on the outcomes that are set forth in the um, district improvement plan and the superintendent's goals. Yeah, it's on page, well, it's page nine page of the nine. rubric. So really it's based on the multiple measures which I've to, I'm gonna be describing in the district improvement plan and in my goals. Mr. Weiss. Maybe now is not the right time, so tell me if we redirect this question and I'm okay to do that. Um, you mentioned as we were going through the, the, the octagon, I mean, the pentagon of mm -hmm. all the steps, right? The first step was your self-assessment. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the corporate culture, when I do my self-assessment, I have to give it to my bosses for them to look at and say, yeah, I agree, I disagree, or whatever else. And I realize you've used that to inform the district improvement plan and to inform your own goals. Yeah, just but are we yeah, able to, or can we, see your self-assessment as well? We really have not done that as a practice in this district. We feel that that's something that, if it's being done correctly, it's part of a person's professional uh, responsibility to assess their strengths and weaknesses. You, you assessed me last spring. Yep. So. I'm not saying uh, we're going to assess your self-assessment, right? But I think it, it informs us with regards to the way in which we look at the rest of the goals, the, the understanding of the assessment we gave. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a 360. I view reviews as a very much a 360-related process, right? Mm -hmm. It's continuous, somewhat like the octagon, I mean, the pentagon that we see there. But it's all part of that, yep, you heard me, or, you know, you missed something. We may have missed something. I see this thing as, a, as an area for my improvement. Okay, we agree, we disagree. It's all part of a continuous conversation to a degree. Um, so that's why I'm asking the question. I don't know if I'm on an island here, which it might be fine, but. Um, um, I took your feedback, the whole committee's feedback very seriously, and I used that to incorporate what I'm doing this year, so. So, I guess I'll, in that's I, I'm the question. only person that really has six evaluators, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit. <laughs> so, I, no, that's a good, good, question and thing to bring so is, I don't know is that something that when you provide it, your evidence you know all the, the stuff we get is that something that can be part of that or or is that just kind of notes you keep and it's not really a formal report or I, mean, I guess you follow what yeah I, I think I have to process this question because yeah. we purposely in this district and a lot of other districts do not ask for the, the educator's self-assessment. That's their own personal tool on where they think they are as, a, as an educator. And what will, and I, I'm not saying this would happen, but you may then have a tendency to look at my self-assessment and yeah. use that as your own methodology when you're about, because it's the same exact rubric. I'm using the rubric that you're going to be using to evaluate me. I guess uh, some of that, well, when we meet with you after we submit our evaluations, we have the one-on-one -on -one yeah. meetings, maybe have a dialogue, you know, this, your evaluation uh, aligns or doesn't align with how I was thinking I was doing. I don't know, you know, just, just thinking out loud. Yes. I keep thinking about the Kellyism, the 10 pounds in a five pound bag. I didn't make it up, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I heard it first. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and I feel like we have an interim, a formative opportunity to talk about the evaluation and it's maybe in February. I don't know if it's still in February given we're do not doing this till October, but um, I sort of feel like I want, I want more time for our administrators to focus on our kids, to be in the schools, to be working on their projects, to be finding the grants, to be following through and supporting the teachers. And I feel like if we already have an interim opportunity for the formative evaluation, and he's heard him, and we've he's heard us. Dr. Doherty has heard us, and we've um, he created this document here with his goals, so which presumably incorporates some of what he heard. That the next time to be that formative, and in the meantime, we're also getting our school committee agenda, and we're getting reports on things that relate to the district improvement plan. So I, yeah, I, don't I have think heard that. from teachers how cumbersome the evaluation process can be, and I don't want to paralyze our administrators or our teachers, because it's aligned, with so much evaluation that they can't do their work. I mean, first of all, I, w I, I was still in the thinking, kind of trying to digest the, the question. Oh, it's not so an I'm attack not, at all. It's my but, job my first inclination is 
Yeah, I don't want to create more steps or more work, but that's a step that's already being done, uh, is what I think what Mr. Wise was asking for. So, and I don't think it's drilled down to, I don't think it was drilled down to all the teachers and administrators, it was just the superintendent's evaluation, but. Just for clarity, we only, we only manage or oversee one person, right? So I wasn't asking about anybody else. I wasn't asking him to apply the same thing to his administration team or them to their teachers necessarily. Um, it was really more of a, from my particular experience in every company I've ever been in, and that's the public sector, the private sector versus the public sector, I get that, right? But there's that review process of, well, tell me what you think about how you did, and I'll tell you what I think, right? We've, we've told him what he thinks, but we haven't heard what he thinks necessarily, other than, thank you, it was a good year, right? I mean, that's the only difference. Please. Yeah, just Mr. Parks and then. I, I think when we do our one-on-one -on -one sessions, that's when we get that feedback. Um, I know when I met with John, mine was very slim this year, but I was able to ask the questions, where do you think you're at with communication? And I used what I wrote up to ask those questions. Not that I was gonna be able to change anything at that point, but it's, it's, it's gauging his response to what I'm putting. Um, yes, corporate world, we all do self-assessments self all the time. I do it twice a year. Um, with public sector, I, it, it's a one-time thing per year, and you move on. Um, I don't think it really shows value that we have to have it, but if we can discuss it on that one-on-one -on -one meeting when we're going over, I think that is a, a compromise I can accept. Dr. Doxey. I was just going to say, um, similar with the one-to-one, -one, that we were back and forth about what my perception was, what his perception Dr. Darty's perception was, and and I'm seeing my feedback in some of the documents that he's produced, and um, and in the changes that are happening, and so that's some of my feedback as well. But I was not. I don't have a problem with the conversation at all. I was trying to listen to the way it's been done and why it's been done that way and responding to that, that I'm comfortable with the self-reflection being his way to our administrators, and I know we only evaluate the superintendent, um, but we're talking about no lining and him role modeling, and so I brought that in um, because, like with the teachers, it takes a lot of time to do this evaluation, and our experience has been that we get a tremendous package of evidence at the end of the year, and then in the middle of the year, we also get information to review. So to add that to me right now doesn't, and to spend another school committee meeting on it when there's so much we need to cover, that to me doesn't hit the priority list to me. I mean, in, in the, you know, in our imaginary worlds, maybe we'd have time and that would be really useful. I guess for me, I'm finding the, the evidence in what we're experiencing. Yeah, I'll just add as, as an educator who goes through the process, it, it has not been um, the practice that I am turning in an assessment formally. It is, I think when Dr. Doctor just used the word reflection, it is more of just a step you take that you reflect before you, and then your goals actually do get submitted. So that's, I guess, my perspective on that piece of it. Thank you. Just two quick points on this concept. So I think the, the fundamental difference between the private and the public sector, and also between a self-reflection from a staff member or a principal and a superintendent is the public nature of it. So I think that's, that's apples and oranges somewhat. Um, and my other thought is I would be curious if there was any appetite to go down this road to find out if other districts do it because I would be very loath to create, um, I'd be loath to create um, a standard that no other superintendent's being asked to do because in as a hiring body as well as an oversight body, we have to make sure that 
that we're creating an environment that's fair and equitable and consistent and not onerous and un unnecessarily onerous. So I would just sort of add that into our thinking. Yes. So I'll just end here. I mean, start the conversation. Good conversation, right? Um, that said, I don't understand the onerous nature because it's already done, right? I mean, in terms of whether we have to have a whole committee meeting to review it, technically, if we see it, it probably has to be public, but whether we discuss it or not, I don't know that we actually need to necessarily. Somebody can opine and tell me otherwise. But if it's in the packet, it's in the packet, right? Um, so, but that said, I understand the personal nature of it as well. There's a truth to that. It's just more of the, for me, and again, I'm just one person, and I'll let it lie here, because it's clearly it's one to five, which is fine. Um, it's, it's part of what informs the goal creation process. It's a huge part of what informs the goal creation process. And as we all know, this is the first time we've seen the goals. We haven't had a conversation about it. So we don't have anything else that leads to what informed the goal process other than our own feedback from last year and our own personal experiences throughout the school system. Plus all the evidence we saw last year and all that stuff. So I don't think I'm asking for anything except for seeing it, but that's, again, we'll let it lie from there. Dr. Dougherty, did you want to continue? Or? Sure. So I'm gonna move on to the district improvement plan piece now. Yeah. Um, so to give a little context to this, this, this process actually began during the summer um, in my absence by the district leadership team, uh, principals, uh, Assistant Superintendent Kelly, Chief Financial Officer Dowd, Director of Student Services, um, Stice, um, in terms of going through, really taking a look at because we were ending a district improvement plan, as you as you know, and really taking a look at what were the areas that, um, as a district leadership team, we needed to focus on for um, this upcoming year. In conversations with the chair and the vice chair, I know what was um, discussed is this would be a one-year plan versus a three-year plan. A um, couple of reasons for that. One is uh, not to use this as an excuse, but the leave of absence that I was on um, really didn't give us the opportunity as a full district leadership team to have the conversations that we normally have during the summer in preparation for, for the upcoming year. The other reason, which you're going to see in goal four, is that we're very excited that we want to move forward with getting community feedback on the vision of the graduate. So I'll go into more detail on that later. With, with the understanding that we're going to use a lot of that information to help set up our next district improvement plan, next three-year plan. So that's why you see a one-year plan. It's why you see, um, you know, the, the, the reason why we went with that direction. So I also want to tell you that the template that we're using, and you've probably seen this in other um, improvement plans that we've done, so we follow the the template that's put forward by, by the Department of Education. Um, and what you have here in your packet um, is broken down. So we have the mission and the vision, those things have, and the theory of action. Those three things have not changed from previous years. Um, as we go through the vision of the graduate, my, my guess is that we will be changing our vision, um, if not completely, but maybe, but at least there'll be some modification if not a complete change to the, to the vision piece. Um, based on that, the goal that uh, we want to move forward with is during the 2019-20 school year, which I believe is right here, yep. Uh, the Reading Public Schools will improve data systems, provide training and support for staff, and enhance a safe and supportive learning environment for all students. The success of our students will be evidenced by the following, and what we've listed there are the, the measurable pieces. To go more specificity, you want to take a look at the outcome piece, which is um, at the bottom of the district improvement plan. So what we have done using the DESI model is we took the district goal and we broke that down into three strategic objectives, A, B, and C. Strategic objective A, which is data systems, um, is the school district will refine and support a data system. 
Built to inform our work, the system will monitor instructional supports and appropriate interventions for students. You'll notice that A will infor informs B and C. So we've done a lot to put our data system in place, and now we want to uh, refine and support it even more. We've made some great strides over the last three to four years with the use of data, and we want to continue that work. So when you move on to B, you take the data analysis from, from A, we will evaluate and refine standards-based instructional systems to meet the needs of all learners. So that's taking a look at your curriculum, your instructional practices, um, your assessments, how, what, what that's going to look like. And then finally, C, how do you create the safe and supportive learning environment using the data from A and B? Um, so the school district will monitor student social emotional growth, refine systems of support to ensure a healthy and successful learning community while meeting the unique needs of the students. So under each strategic objective, um, there are the strategic initiatives, which is essentially your action steps. How are you going to reach that um, strategic objective throughout the year? And again, remember, this is a one-year plan. And so the conversations that we had with our district um, leadership team is we need to make it manageable. It's a one-year plan. We need to make our action steps manageable. One of the things that I've heard as feedback in the past from the committee and from staff is that we, we, try, we put too much down. We try to do too much. And we kept saying, oh, it's a three-year plan, it's a three-year plan, that's why we put too much. But what we found over those three years is that, yeah, we were able to do a lot, but we were never able to do everything that um, we wanted to. So we were very careful in these conversations to keep asking the question, is this realistic by June? Are the things we're talking about realistic by June? So you can see the strategic initiatives are li uh, listed here under A. These are, these are all the action steps. These are all things that we feel we will either complete or begin doing uh, during this year, which will spill over into the next, um, next school year. Um, and that's captured in the different steps. For B, the same thing. Um, these are all the different strategic initiatives. You'll notice that these are instructionally based, curriculum based, um, to match this strategic objective. And for C, um, the focus is on social emotional, uh, creating self, uh, safe uh, learning environments um, for our students. So that's how we broke it down. And then underneath all of this is, okay, how do we measure our work? So we tried to be as specific as we possibly could um, in our outcomes. And you can see uh, by the bullets how that's broken down. Obviously, taking a look at assessments is a big part of this. Um, not just the state assessments, but our local assessments, um, national assessments, which is the second bullet. Um, we took a look at we're taking a look at discipline referrals, um, suspensions, and we're breaking that down by subgroup. Um, we're taking a look at student learning environment scores, and we used the Pride survey data from a year ago, which we shared with you, because we are going to be doing the Pride survey again in in the. Uh, late winter, early spring. Um, so we, we purposely are taking a look at things that last time we may not have been as strong in those categories for students um, and focusing on those. Um, also, we're taking a look at the proportion of students who have 10 or more absences. So that's an area that we've, we've been focusing on and we feel that that's important as well. Um, in terms of staff response in the Pride survey, there were some categories from the last survey that we felt we have been focusing on and we want to make sure that we get the staff feedback in those areas of school leadership, shared decision making, and school climate. Um, one of the things that um, Mrs. Kelly and her staff have been working on are the curriculum guides. So the goal is, is by December of 2020 to have the publishing of the curriculum guides in each subject area, along with teacher resources, pacing guides, things like that. Um, 
We also are working on two cycles. One is a five-year cycle for special education program review, and the other um, is to create a curriculum cycle. Um, for each curriculum area, we'll be going through a series of steps through a renewal cycle, and when it's going to be their, their point to do a full, full uh, change in the, the curriculum. Um, we also have some capital items in here as well that are connected to safety and security and um, making sure we have safe learning environments for our students. These are things that we're working on, as you know, uh, that we've been reporting out on. So that's the district improvement plan piece. So I'd probably be good to stop at this point. Just threw a lot at you. Question? Yes. I do, actually. Um, I have a sensitivity to the appearance of priority, and I know from a discussion that the list of outcomes is not in a priority order. That's correct. Um, however, I think that it's important to recognize that even if it's not intended, it might be read that way. And when I'm going through this list, there are things that I think are really powerful reading indicators um, that would be more important than necessarily scores on a national or a standardized test. And so I'm wondering, um, I'd like to recommend that some of those indicators go towards the top as opposed to being later on. So my suggestion, um, a decrease in the average number of um, discipline referrals. I mean, that's a really clear indicator that something has changed. And I think that's really important. It's really indicative, reflective of what's happening here. Whereas there's all sorts of other stuff going on in the standardized test results. They're important to a point, but I think that absences, distance for discipline referrals, um, the pride survey, um, and the projects and their progress towards completion are really important and shouldn't be at the bottom of the list. I think they should be closer to the top of the list, of the outcome list. And I had yeah. one more. A question, again, it's about choice of words. Um, so in the district improvement plan, so, um, the under strategic B and strategic C, the choice of words was based on data analysis. And we've talked about um, data driven and data informed. And so I was just wondering about the wording there and the implications of the wording to be based. And I don't know if I'm getting too in the weeds. Um, maybe I am, but. I was thinking that um, it's informed by data analysis, not just based on it, because there's so much more going on than just the data analysis. That it's based on it implies that the data, again, is just, is fund all the priority there. And it's important, I'm not saying it's not, I just, wouldn't it be informed by data analysis? Would that make more sense? That's what she's asking. You for. did that's say what, Yeah, that's what I was saying, informed by data analysis. And you can say no, Dr. Docs or Linda, whatever you want to say. I'm not saying yes I'm or no saying, anything. I think that's No, I'm saying, <laughs> you what? I'm not saying yes or no or anything. I, I was just trying to understand what. But I realize that you all had conversations, extensive conversations about this. So you probably had reasons for the words that you chose, you being plural, because you all worked really hard on this really important and really impressive district improvement plan. And so this is not, it's not meant to be an intense criticism, it's just a question about I think it's a good one. Yeah, the, the impact word, yeah, of yeah, words. Yeah, it's fine, the words are fine. Thank you. 
Mr. Y. So I'm going to agree and disagree. Um, I'll agree with the informed by. It is one element. I think it's a higher element than some other people do, but it's just one element in the greater scheme of things. Um, so personally, I think that's a friendly amendment if such a thing existed in this case, and I would support it. Um, I'll disagree with the reorganization of the objectives. Um, I just think it's really kind of, they're all just there, they're all equal weight. If there's some way at the beginning you could say, you know, all of these need to be achieved. It's not that one needs to be achieved or 10 needs to be achieved. They all need to be achieved. They're not nor numbered one, two, three, four, five. They're either all done or they're not all done um, as they're written, right? That's my view of that. Um, and I have one question to ask as well. Um, a lot of this from a measurement perspective is based upon pride data. Um, and the last time we ran pride in 2017, we did not review the results until September or October of the following year. So it could not be used as inf informing the year end review process. Um, in fact, we used it to inform last year's process instead of the year before that's process. Um, so I'm curious, MCAS theoretically we can use the one we just did, right? Because we'll have it published and it's already there and whatnot. It's, it is a trailing indicator, for lack of a better way to say it, but pride will not be likely unless we move up the dates and if that's the plan. Yeah, that is, that the, is plan. the plan. I, okay. we, it was our first time doing the pride and we didn't realize the amount of work. Plus, as if you remember, uh, Principal Boynton actually had to do three of the grades the first week of school because mm -hmm. um, they weren't done the previous year. Yeah. So we, our plan is to do it more mid -winter, uh, late winter this year instead of uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Did you is that? Um, well, I guess I guess I still have the mic. So um, the question I, I would ask as well is, um, we in a lot of the predecessing, a lot of the starting statements around this is this is a one-year plan, um, theoretically covering the 2019-2020 school year. Mm -hmm not 2020, 2021, but some of these outcomes are measured in 2021. So do we, so it says by December 20, by November 2020, do we either scale those back to something that can be delivered by end of June, or do we reword them? Do we, is, it, is there any way that we can commit to that within the, the cycle period that we're talking about uh, as part of this review period? And I know that's I think probably it would be asking difficult, too much, but yeah, maybe I think it, it would be difficult to do that. Well, because the the December that's the curriculum guides, mm -hmm. and a lot of that's going to be based on when you know Mrs. Kelly's going to be able to get staff together to have the conversations to get the guides completed in a timely manner. You know, I don't think we want to. We could get a. Uh, an update. An update yep, prior to evaluation yeah. and, you know. Well, that would be in the evidence piece. Yeah, you would and, get and, and you'd get something in the evidence piece as to where we are, that here are the ones we have left to do, you know. And they will be done by. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're on track or we're not on track. Yeah, I mean, I, the only reason I raised the question is that, you know, historically, other than the last year in which we turned out, Ms. Kelly and her staff turned out a ton of them, right? Historically, we've had a habit of saying we're going to do this and, not yep. getting it done within the review period, right? Yep. So I don't think we'll have that problem necessarily, but in, and also in alignment with SMART, measurable, da da da, right? Realistic in the period going until June, maybe it's a tailoring back, maybe it's we will commit to social studies by the end of June. Maybe not all everything, but we will commit to math by the end of June. Whatever it is, so that it is something that is absolutely achievable to be done uh, within the review period we're talking about. Maybe I'm just one again, but. So we could do, sorry, go oh, no. well, I We think could do it either way. We could pair it back as you're saying, uh, so that we absolutely know something's done or we, or we can, you know, listen to that report or update in, in May or whatever that says, you know, this is what's been done and this, these will be done by uh, December. Yeah, I think we're trying to be realistic and not have the 
um, artificial barrier of an evaluation cycle get in the way. So some of these are purposely December 2020 for that reason. We don't want to say June 2020 and say, oh, which is what I think we did in the past. So we're trying to be more realistic to our timelines. Which is why I was asking if it can be paired to something specific that we know is achievable by June. Right? I'm not saying, as it's written, it's basically saying we've done everything, right? All curriculum guides for all grades, all schools, fully aligned by, by December, 2020, December 2020, right? right? Which is 12, 13 months, 14 months from now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's not within the one year period of this district improvement plan. So again, I mean, maybe Chuck's, uh, Mr. Robinson's um, happy medium is, is possible, but another happy, happy medium might be, yeah, we're pretty confident we can get so social studies done or something else along those lines. I don't think we can commit to a specific subject or number of subjects tonight. I don't think that that, nor could we do it next week or the week out. I mean, a, a lot of it depends on the time and resources that for those departments to be able to work together and, and get the drug guides done. So on this particular, I really do hear your point, Mr. Wise, but on this particular goal, I think that there is a way that it could still be very measurable, which is in July of this year, 2019, how many curriculum guides have been published? We'll be looking at this in May or June of 2020. How many more have been published during this one year cycle? What's left for the next six months and are we on track to meet it? That feels reasonable to me as a, you know, is it a guarantee that they'll be done for December 20th? It's not, but I feel like you can clearly see whether or not progress towards that goal was made. Maybe, maybe we do leave it as that open-ended that progress will be made or a certain percentage or whatever. One of the things that I'm hesitant to commit, Mr. Wise, is and I was faced with this in June at the end of the year when there were a few departments that we were still tweaking. And I, I want to be really authentic to the process mm -hmm. and to our teams who have worked so hard. So I don't want to publish things until they're ready to go. Um, and that means many, many drafts in some departments. It meant hours of one-on-one -on -one sessions and really kind of fine-tuning things. And, and they're meant to be living documents. We're going to continue to revisit them. But I, John and I talked about this exact point when we put it in here. Um, I am fully committed to having them done by December 2020. And we're on that path. I, I don't know where we'll be in June. It'll be probably closer to 100% completion. <coughs> but it, we may need the summer to refine some things. And I'm OK with that. But you know, I think to put an uh, sort of an arbitrary amount in there or a certain department, I, that doesn't feel right to me because it's not just mine. I could write all of them in the next two weeks <laughs> you know, and publish them, I mean, based on the state standards, but then they're not workable, they're not usable, and they're not teacher and, and department head driven. So um, we, we just want to be really authentic about the process. I know looking at the ones from high school, and I had the privilege of watching two of the department heads actually present their own work. Yeah. They were impressive. They, they, you could see the amount of time yeah. it took in each document and the, and the pride it took from each department head to get these documents out and, mm -hmm. and truly in the, into people's hands. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're going to see that continue. The work ethic's there. We know the work ethic is there. Um, do I think we need to be able to measure that work ethic? Yeah, and I think we actually can by what we're seeing. If we're seeing drafts, if, you know, I'm sure that she's not going to hand over the a, a first draft and say, here it is. Uh, Mrs. Kelly is very professional. She wants to make sure everything is I's are, I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Um, PTO meetings for the high school, they're going over each of these different groups. And they have the department heads there doing it. Um, the last one was math and English. And each department head sat and took questions right in this room on anything that was in those guys. And it was a good hour, meeting, hour and a half meeting. A little over an hour. OK. And it was the best turnout the PTO has ever had. And that's continuing in the next meeting. Um, I think where we're at now with what's here, we can measure. Is, is it a, a distinct time frame? Yeah, we know December 2020 is the date that we should have everything in hand. 
Um, should we have more than what we have now? Yes, absolutely. Um, even if they're in draft form, I'm sure Mrs. Kelly will say, here's the drafts right now. Now give them back. We're going to finish them. <laughs> yeah. We could do that too. Um, I, mean, other, I just think that's the way we yeah. see progression in this. I think yeah. the other thing is too, I think I can't word it like you worded it, but in terms of letting the evaluation process dictate how, I mean, I can tell you right now if I sign off on something that says that I'm going to see something in December 2020, just because it's past the evaluation doesn't mean I'm going to be looking for answers as to why it's not done right. if it's not done in December 20. You know what I'm trying to say? Well, I know what you're trying to say. And again, I want to stress that I'm not in any way, you know, saying Mrs. Kelly and the staff and all of the staff at the elementary and the high school, everybody who's done their stuff already has not put in a tremendous amount of work because, you know, I was probably was one of the, one of the first standing up there singing thank yous from that side of the room, right? Um, I, you know, I fully support that effort, just so we're clear. Um, and I appreciate the artificial statement, right? The concern about the artificial statement. Um, and no offense to the peers on the room, but as I said before, until this last year, and thankful for Ms. Kelly for being here, until this last year, it was a goal from 2010 until 2018, and it was not done. And frankly, nobody said boo about it, really in any other ways, right? So that's part of the reason why I'm <coughs> making a, a point about some of it is that there is a period, there is a cycle, and that cycle either something is or is not done. And in this case, we're saying for this cycle, we're okay with this not being done if we approve these as they are, which may be as a collective body, body we are okay with. But let's also be realistic that this, di this district improvement, improvement plan as it's written will be, for lack of a better way to say, because you know it will inform the next one, but this one will be thrown out this time next year because there will be a new one, right? So there's a measurability question of going from one to the next. And this one says it will be done when the next one has already started, right? Which isn't, doesn't seem right to me from a timeline continuum perspective. And again, I don't want to no offense in any, to any of the effort in any way, no, shape, no, or form. Taken, it's I, all a matter of measurability within the period of time that we're talking about. It, That's the only objection if I'm, I, I have. If there. I can just add, though, whatever goes in the next district improvement plan, I would, I would assume that this would be part of it because it would be part of the next district improvement plan. It will have curriculum guides by December 2020. All curriculum guys, but I'm sorry. We have a lot already. I misspoke. I'm sorry. That's not what I meant. That we so it would be it would be anything that's here that has a past date of June would go in the next district improvement plan. That that would be my well, let me put it this way, I'll put it in. If the committee wants to take it out, that's fine, but we just want to be realistic. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason. I mean, I could put you in 2020, and that's not realistic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've said what i got to say, but I don't, I mean, whatever other people want to address it or not, as the case may be. I guess, um, unless, I, I, you know, Ms. Kelly, if you knew X number of drafts might be done by a certain date, and we could say, you know, if you, did kind of a low ball target, but we knew it, we could definitely cut and dry it. I guess it's the only other benchmark type option I can imagine, but but I, I totally get your point about, you know, you don't, let's not rush the process. Let's, it's been a long time since they've been done. Let's do them really, really well. I, I was just basically gonna say that I'm comfortable because we'll get a report on the progress of where they're at and so they're not supposed to be done by June 2020, but I mean June, yeah, 2020, but we will know where they are and that there has been progress on them. So, and we've also seen the progress that came when Mrs. Kelly hit the ground running when she started working here with the others. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with the goal of December 2020 with the interim report on where things are. Personally. Yes. 
So then just to, I mean, it sounds like there's a general consensus amongst the, the rest of you that there should be, an, uh, that the wording as it is is generally okay, but there's an expectation of some sort of interim report. So maybe the interim report and the progress demonstrated in the interim report is what is measurable in mm -hmm. here. Okay. And so maybe we can add it's something to- It's part of to, the evidence. It's part of the evidence. Right, so what I would be doing is I would be reporting out in my evidence here are the guides that have been done. And here are what left. Here's the plan to get r the rest of the guides completed by December 2020. That would be in the evidence. So this is where I get a little bit pedantic with the word, with the SMART goals statement, right? Um, SMART has the word specific, specific, right? Measurable, realistic. So we've we talked about the measurability already. But the specificity of it, I think, is it's very specific from a timeline. So the T is very clear. Time is very clear. The realistic, we've heard from Mrs. Kelly that she believes these are realistic, uh, which means they're attainable as well. But the specific, I think, is maybe for the interim portion of this deliverable is maybe missing. And I would say as well, in some of these other cases, specific is, ve is very much missing in terms of what we're, we're thinking is achievable or realistic, right? So we're saying we're going to increase or we're going to decrease the gap. What's realistic, right? Do we say we're going to decrease the achievement gap does that mean, and I had conversations on this with multiple people in the public, does that mean we're, obviously doesn't mean, doesn't say close, so we're not going from 30 point gap to zero point gap, but what is realistic in this measurement period for, close, for decreasing that gap? Is it five points, is it two points, is it, and is it an aggregate across all the school grades? You know, what are we, what's the specific nature of that so that we can say yes or no um, and, you know, as we go through that, is there a little bit more measurability that we can put in some of those cases as well? And we can say, we're going to decrease this gap, and we think it's realistic and attainable based upon everything we've done. And frankly, we've already got the data, so we should be able to clearly answer the question in this case, right? At least in the MCAS case. We're going to decrease it by two, two points achievement, and we're going to improve the we're going to see a greater growth in our in the high needs population by five points growth, something. I, I mean, and I know there's no magic number. Um, maybe there's a percentage growth that we can say something else along those lines that makes it more specific and measurable. Because as one individual looking at it, you know, the way I did it at the time was look at the cohorts. Did they close? How many cohorts were there, etc. And some people disagreed with that, but that was the way I approached it. And I don't want to necessarily get into a point where I'm looking at it in a different way and judging it differently, fairly or unfairly. I'd like to be fair with everybody else uh, of what that measurement looks like. Yes. So in the history of standardized tests, there have been specific goals set in terms of what school districts have to reach and what their numbers have to be and it's created wreaked havoc in school systems because the standardized tests become the priority. They have even gone so extreme as to base a superintendent's bonus on what their scores are and their improvements. And I would hate to see the standardized tests become that important in Reading. I think that the direction that they're going, I can buy that. Um, we want to decrease the difference between in the achievement gap, but to pick an arbitrary number um, that our kids have to improve on a test that changes every year, I I'm not comfortable with that because we're going to have lots of other indicators that we're going to be looking at and we'll be able to see progress by the constellation of things that change that we've had. But I'm not comfortable with saying, well, okay, we, they have to be 10 points better across the board. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not, I don't want it to be a goal of our administrators or our central office team to focus on scores that closely. I want them to focus on our children and the constellation of assessment tools they have. I mean, Chuck, are you? Okay? Yeah. yeah. I understand that, right, which is why I said percentage, right? 
um, you know, there's a measurable amount of improvement that can be shown. This to me is one of the greatest equity issues there is that we have, right? They're either are learning or they're not learning. And whether we like it or not, a lot of times these scores show whether they are learning or not. They're not the only score, right? I'm not saying it's the be all and end all. It's one of 10 things on this list. But they are showing in many cases whether the student is learning or not. Now they can have a bad day and you can have all those kind of things that go on as well. That's why you look at it in the aggregate, not an individual student necessarily. But our numbers from a high needs perspective, yeah, even compared to some of our peers, are frankly not good enough. And, we, and that's why it's a goal, that's why it's listed. I, I think it's self-acknowledged that they're not good enough. So the question is, what is a measurable improvement that we're comfortable with that makes sense, right? And as it's listed, you know, it could be 1% and you could achieve that. Or it could be 10%, you could achieve that. It could be 25%, you can achieve that, right? So I'm not saying what the number is necessarily, but I am thinking that I could view improvement significantly different than you can view improvement based upon the wording of this goal as it is written right now. In incredibly different, right? And you could say, well, look, I see two, gr two grades that showed great improvement. And I could say, well, I see six grades that went backwards. So amongst those, I think we went backwards, not forwards. And so that's, that's why I'm asking the question, so that we're all on the same page when we go to actually do the review and we're on, we understand what we're trying to achieve in closing that achievement gap. I, go ahead. I do have a response to that. Um, in talking, talking about equity, I don't think these tests are the ones that we should hold way up. Their, their standardized tests are often criticized for not being equitable measures of student growth. Um, and I think that, um, that when we look at the focus, I lost my thought, when we look at the focus of the tests, I think that the data informed nature, the teachers are going down into the weeds to look at what questions inform their instruction. And that's more important to me than a percentage or anything else. They're doing that deep dive to understand what the implications are of the scores that kids get in certain areas. So I don't really want to put more emphasis on that um, and give it a number because I, I think there are many ways for, for them to get their information and us to get that information on progress. Um, I have a position that's sort of in between these two. I actually hear Mr. Wise's mm -hmm. point, and I think it's valid. I think it's more compelling if we were looking at three-year goals. These are goals for this spring. So, so to say X percent in one year, I think MCAS results are more helpful looking at multi-year trends. So I, I, if we were having this discussion this spring about the three-year goals, I think I'd be inclined to say it. I think for just this one year, um, a decrease is adequate, particularly g given some of the strength we saw in the last year in this area. Yes. Yeah. Jeffrey Carr. Jeffrey Carr in Madrid. I want to agree with Ms. Borowski's comment that it, it's, it's hard to do something like that in one year. And, you know, I'd be worried about gimmicks or something that, you know, you focus on something that, um, but, but yeah, I mean, we do want to see something, and, and for those subgroups where we're seeing difficulties, we want to see something measurable, to Mr. Wise's point. The other concern I had was on the, the district improvement plan goals. A bunch of these are uh, increased, uh, the measurement is done by survey, and I just, I don't feel like I'm going to get a hard answer from something of whether you're meeting or not. You know, if, if student engagement is measured through survey and observation, it's kind of feels uh, qualitative to me, not quantitative or increase in teacher efficacy as measured by survey data, you know, or the pride survey, like, you know, if, if the sports team has some great thing the day before they do the survey or, you know, there's a pep rally or, or you know, something happens in town that, you know, affects how people feel about something, it's going to have a huge impact on how they respond on that survey. And I'm, I'm not convinced that that's a good way to measure improvement um, on engagement. Uh, for the district over a year. Thank you. Can I just comment on that? So that, the, the one you were reading, that's the teacher survey. Those are the categories 
from the last pride survey that we were weaker in. So that's why we purposely put those down. The pride survey did provide a lot of useful data for our principals working with staff on how we can improve some of these areas. So that was the teacher piece. Mr. Wise. Um, the one thing I was going to say is this achievement gap goal isn't a one-year goal. It's a carryover from the last district improvement plan. So we've already seen two years of improvement theoretically. And, you know, this is not a one-year thing. The, the processes have been put in place that we think collectively, especially amongst the administration staff, we think will solve some of those things. So this is not saying any, in fact, if I read it right, it's even going back to 2017 as the baseline, right? So it's, which I would even say you could both go even further back in some cases, um, but that's another story for another day as well. But if that's what it's saying, 2017. No, that was for the SAT because that's oh. when the new test started. Okay. That's okay. why I used 2017. I missed that. So thank yeah, you for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, the next gen MCAS, you could look at it over a three year period because it's been there for three years now. Right, and it's not a, it, it, while it's listed here, it was also listed in the last district employment plan. It's not a three, it's not a one year thing. It's not a new trick, right? It is what we've had there, and we should have a very clear ability to measure from where we were to where we're going. And either we are making improvement or we're not. And at least, at least what's the rubric? If you don't want to say what the percentage is, how are you going to measure it, right? It's not just a decrease or whatever. It's, I'm going to look at, you know, High needs versus non-high needs, because the public data is only high needs versus total. But we need to take high needs out of the total number, which the district administration has access to, but you can do the math as well. It's which grades are we talking about? It's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or three, five, five, six, seven, eight, at least. Um, potentially 10, right, depending on the test. We just have, at least we need to understand what we're measuring. And I, I don't think it's as it's written, it's very clear about how we're going to measure, not to mention what we're going to measure. Um, and I know from looking at the reviews, there was no consensus amongst that as we just did the reviews last time either. So if we're not gonna agree on a percentage, we should agree on a consensus of how we're gonna measure it. So we know going into next May and next June, we're using the same process of measurement at the very least. What local assessments are you referring to, Dr. The Dory? Finus and Purnell and the AMC. I believe I have that in you. Yeah. You do. Yeah, yeah the last yeah. photograph, yeah. the Sorry. second bullet. I think, yeah, I think I have that in yep. you. You do. Um, are we tracking changes in that locally so we can at least look at that piece? I don't think we're going to agree state level on MCAS percentages and things like that over a one year goal. But are we tracking this enough that we can track percentage increases the, on this? The Finals and Pinell and the yep. Yes. Because it, it's administered, uh, the Finals and Pinell is administered three times. Three times. So would that be, you know, seeing that change, would that work as a, as a one-year goal? My, if you're asking me, Mr. Price, yes, please. My, AMC might, I don't know enough about it. F and P is not something I believe in as personally as a measure. Um, from a reading perspective, as one of the other yeah. commentators mentioned earlier, it doesn't measure the essential components of reading instruction. It does not. It measures whether you can do some fluency, maybe a little bit of comprehension, maybe a little bit of word knowledge, but it doesn't measure decoding, doesn't measure phonemic awareness, doesn't measure a few other things, right? Uh, and it doesn't break that down. So from my perspective, that's not something that I'm going to look at heavily. Now, with that said, there is an interesting correlation between the numbers that we got for March and how the MCAS scores scored, right? Where we saw almost 40% of our fifth graders not reading at level, according to FMP, and that same nearly 40% did not meet the, ex the expectations in MCAS. So there is a correlation, whether it's strong or one time, is to be determined. The other question I have about that, that particular assessment as it is, is it's the bar, the benchmark has moved, right? So they were fourth graders last year, now they're fifth graders this year, and, or third graders to fourth graders, and you're starting to go into the point from learn to read to read to learn, 
right? And so the, the bar has moved in terms of that. Now, from a teacher perspective, is it informing their practice? Should be. Maybe. Um, I think there are some believers and some non-believers in terms of practice informant. So I think that's to be determined. But I think the one that we absolutely can measure that is normed, whether we like it or not, is MCAS. So, I mean, I think we've kind of, my perspective, we kind of beat this horse, but I don't know what we want to do. Pardon the, the terminology. Are you, are you done with your? No. Why don't you continue with? So in addition to the district improvement plan, um, there were four goals. Um, the first goal, as Ms. Uh, Dr. Doxer had stated, really is the implementation in leading the district and leading the district in the implementation of the district improvement plan. I do get evaluated on a district improvement plan. I figured I might as well put it in as, an, as a goal as well. So really, that's what this goal is: is working with others, empowering them to do the work um, for the implementation of that plan. So I don't think I have to go into a lot of detail with that one. Um, the second goal is um, improving the physical and psychological security of our schools. So this was a goal last year. Um, and so I've, I've made some changes in the action steps to make it more updated to where we are with this. Um, I felt it was important to keep it as a goal for one more year, uh, given the, the nature that we do have um, you know, a lot of changes that we're making with safety, security, um, social, emotional learning, things like that. So, and you see that the action steps are, are listed in, in there. The third goal uh, is more of a capital project goal. Um, this one is working, actually the, both goals two and three are working very closely with the town. Um, so town manager, police, fire, um, facilities in terms of goals two and three. So this, these are more uh, interdepartmental with town and schools. And then the fourth goal, which i um, very excited about, and it is something that the high school is doing as part of their NEASC work, but some districts have embraced it and expanded it to make it a district um, initiative is to do the district vision of the graduate. So um, this is really over the next, uh, it's, it's two years, it's actually less than two years, but working with the community, and that includes every, everyone in the community, um, to learn about and develop a vision of what skills, knowledge, and disposition Reading students should attain and develop during their pre-K to 12 years. So. Although the bulk of the work early on will be at the high school level, the goal is to work backwards. Once you identify what is, what do we want our students to graduate with, to work back at the end of eighth grade, then to work back at the end of fifth grade, and then work back at the end of preschool. So the idea is, is that we then create this vision, um, pre-K to 12, that leads to um, what do we want our students to graduate with for um, the skills of that and the habits of mind and how do those learning experiences equate to what we're doing in the classroom and what are we doing as a district? As part of this, it will help inform our work to develop our next district improvement plan. Um, so that's, those are the four goals of my annual plan so in, can you just go back to that for a second sure. uh, so in theory this sh if, if we're going to use it to develop the next three-year district improvement plan we really can't spend two years yeah it's I not know two. You said I'm sorry. It's probably the, less than two the years. timeline it has to be done by November 2020 because the high school needs it for their decennial 
well, it's not decennial, but it is the decennial visit um, in December. But we'll be, I mean, we should, we should have been done with the this three year, because we, we're going to start working on that in the spring. What? The three year district improvement plan. Right, but we'll have, we will be having data along the way that will help inform our work on that. Some of the feedback I'm hearing, Dr. Doherty, in regards to number two, um, where we've got a lot of kids in this district with anxiety over Alistair's. Mm -hmm. How is that being worked on to reduce that and reduce this, the parent at the same time? Because the parent's just as anxious that this child has to go through this drill as the student is. And I've heard parents ask for information on when it's going to be so they can remove them for that day to reduce that anxiety. I've heard, you know, I've, I think we've all read things that show the drills aren't always effective for every student. And if you've got somebody that's going through an anxiety issue during that time, it's not going to be effective. Are we looking that in the, at this? We certainly can. Uh, we. We have made, we've done a lot of work in making our drills developmentally appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, there are things, and I've heard horror stories about what other districts do. Um, we do not do some of the things that other districts do. Um, so I want to reassure the community that when we have put drills in place, um, and we've worked very closely with the police on this, that they're very developmentally appropriate. I do think drills are useful. I mean, we do fire drills, we do shelter in place drills. Um, drills are a way for us to be prepared for the unexpected. Um, unfortunately, that's the world we live in. I mean, we, we will continue to take a look at our Alice drills to see if there are things we can do differently. I think the other thing that's important, we haven't done this in a while. Uh, we did it when we first introduced Alice to the district five years ago. Is, and we did do it two years ago when we had a safety summit here in this room actually, is to have parent ed in education on it um, to explain, and we can certainly do that. But I do think they have a useful purpose. We actually have to do multi-hazard yep. evacuation drills by law, yeah. above and beyond the four fire drills. Yes, Linda, sorry. Um, that, that actually um, segues with one of my thoughts, which was um, the discussion at town meeting was, um, I, I thought, kind of unrealistic about how many people can be involved in the security plan. Mm -hmm. But what you just talked about is educating the parents about why we're doing what we're doing, not on the down in the, the weeds, but in general educating them and educating the community about how we can support our kids. Um, and there isn't any mention of... Um, District-wide safety committee. Right, so it says survey data of staff, students, and parents, but I'm thinking about the other way around, to, to give them information, not just get information from them, the parents and students. Do that make sense? No. So I'm sorry. on goal two, <laughs> goal two, it's a two-way street. So you talk about getting information from parents, oh, but not staff, students, idea. but not, not talking back to them. Mm -hmm. It's not in that goal, not giving them the education or information that's safe to do, because I realize there's not all. Am I? Crazy? Oh, you're not looking. Number, She's looking at that. Number two. She's looking I was at following on uh, Mr. Parker. We were talking about I think two, right? Goal two. I think what you're saying is, are we going to, first of all, I mean, this is something, you know, and I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I don't even know whether this should be something we're doing. I don't know whether it should be a goal. It's something we just do. Uh, so I'll leave that at that. Uh, but uh, in terms, I think the, 
the more important, the most important part of this, I think, is what you're saying is is the survey, and are we going to share the results of that? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, when you I was said just two-way street. Share the results of the survey. So we uh, did do a survey with this very. The Pride survey had a parent component that this. There were specific questions asked about: Do you feel your child is safe at school? Right. There were specific questions, and, and my, we're going to do the same thing this year. And my point was: so then presenting to the parents, educating them about what we've learned, not specific security because that can't be shared, but educating them but about what we learned and about how they can prepare their, their students, they can support their students. Um, it's just the other way as well. We're collecting information from people, and town meeting is a specific question. So town meeting, I believe, wanted an update. So to the extent that it's possible, Will we be? Will that be part of your goal? Is to update with the town, update town meeting on town meeting where was we're looking at. for an update on. Yeah, this is not the, the capital, that, that's the security. What the capital implementation spend was for security, not not about this stuff. Okay, I was looking at them as overlapping, because it's all the the safety and security. And, and I love that you put so psychological security in there. As to what, Jean? Um, so I don't know if this helps, but I actually completely agree with what you're saying. I think I understand what you're saying, and it's the importance of communicating out to parents why we do what we do yes. and how it makes their, so I, I think you're completely right. I'm comfortable with it not being in the goal because in my opinion, if we're gonna measure predominantly based on survey data, parents' perception of safety, we will have had to have done that. That's how you get there. That's how you improve the results is by that kind of communication. So I, I think sharing to Dr. Doherty that that's something to think about seems <clears throat> and I'm kind of confident you have thought about that, the importance of that and the principles. I know certainly the communication I get from principals is very thorough on these matters. So I don't, it's more how you get there. So I don't know that the goal is to improve the perception of safety and the actual safety. I don't know that we have to put into the goal oh, that's one more an of action the steps. important ways yeah, to yeah. get there. That's but I think you're highlighting a really important way to get there. I agree completely. I'm just okay with it not being in the goal. Thank you. My <laughs> pleasure for understanding. So, yeah. so, as we agree, it should be one of the action steps, which when documented on page seven, it is not. Right? Um, the, the, the idea of why do we do these drills, what do they what do they help us with how do they prepare your children the you know the playback right for lack of a better way to say a forum um, and you know we've taken communication off from a goal perspective but a a forum perspective that says maybe we should you know we've heard some fears from the community maybe we should educate them more on why we do these things but in case like some cases we're mandated by law here's the law that says we have to so we don't really have a choice Right, so you can tell me not to do it, but the law says I have to, so I, I don't have a choice, right? The law is the law. That could be part of that process. So maybe what they're asking, what I think they're asking is to add something into the yep. activity set that specifically says we'll schedule be more than a forum to. Yeah. to inform the, the parent community on this topic. I definitely don't think it needs to be a forum. I'm very comfortable leaving it up to the administration, whether that is an email communication, whether it's something, I, I'm very comfortable leaving what the medium is up. I wouldn't dictate. Well, to that point, two years ago, we did hold a forum and we had two people show up. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And we right. well publicized yeah. it. We had, yeah, there. there were more town <laughs> employees there <laughs> than there were. <laughs> I also think anecdotally, and it is anecdotal, I think a lot of times when it's just information, parents appreciate getting it in an email because then if I have a question, I know you have office hours, I know I can pick up the phone, but I don't want to have to go out at night more than I already have to if it's information I can just read. So I would add that. The, the, the proactive communication I think is important. I think we can trust our staff to figure out what that looks like. So that, that one I'm okay with. I'm now moving on to the next one unless anybody has anything to add on that one. Um, so I guess th this, I'm on the same page with Mr. Robinson that to a degree it's really not a goal, it's just what we do um, or what we should be doing. Um, the, the slight exception may be the overlap with some of these items with the greater security need yeah. 
um, form goal three, for example, work with chief financial officer and director of facilities to review key access policy, et cetera, which aligns very directly to the security, the greater security goal. Um, you know, the physical plant security, for lack of a better way to say it, to differentiate the two. Um, so I'm wondering if it makes more sense to look at some of these and say, which of these acti activities are status quo, st standard operating procedure, whatever, and which of these are really tied to the physical plant security, and maybe these could get consolidated down into one goal in some way, shape, or form. Um, and then my other question, uh, which answer in any order necessary, is this goal lists policies. Um, and so I wonder if there's anything you need help from us to do in terms of updating policies, crafting policies, or anything else that might support this and support you and the rest of the administration in our role as policy role. That happened right? last year. The school committee last year approved some policies. I took those steps out mm -hmm. because those have been completed. So should we then adjust the goal appropriately to say we're no longer working on adjusting policies, we're now working on procedures or things along those lines, um, infrastructure, safety drills, in which case it becomes even more operational in nature um, and less of a goal. So the reason why I kept this goal in here is there are still things in here that I feel are important and it sends a message that we have some work to do still in this area. If the committee feels that we should take it out, that's fine. It's not, I'm not going to stop doing this work, but that's, I mean, we just completed, for example, number three, two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, so that's an example. There are things that I feel still need to be done. I to me, this is an important goal, but if, in, if the committee wants to, I don't think, it, I, certainly I wasn't suggesting that it wasn't important. No, I, I, no, was, I, no, I wasn't saying that. I was kind of putting, and I don't want to go down down that tonight. I mean, I, yeah, I'm comfortable leaving it. Yeah. What I was saying is, I, I mean, in terms of, in the world we live in today, in terms of security and safety, it should be something that we're doing. It doesn't have to be a goal to make us do it. Like we do our budget, and that isn't one of our goals to do. You know, so that that's, I mean, at some point, it's it's something that we just have to be doing. And yeah, and I, I agree. I think this will be retired at the end of this yeah. year. I do think, like I've heard some things tonight that I think are important, like educating the parent community about why we do some of the drills that we do, something we have not done in the last few years. So I do think there's some pieces in here that still need to happen. So that's why I, I felt it was important to keep it one more year. But I agree, it does need to be retired at some point because you're right, it is part of what we do. I, Dr. Doherty just made the point I was gonna make. I'm comfortable in it with the one-year plan. When we look at this in the spring for the three-year plan, I, I would need kind of a strong argument for how much more work really needs to be done in it. So it sounds like we're tracking on the same thing. One more year to, to put the, particularly given the capital that we're putting into it right now. I think it makes sense to highlight it as a goal, but I'm glad that you're thinking it will be retired and just become what we do part of our operating business. Yes. Just a quick point on that. The capital is the next goal, right? I mean, so we, unless you're referring, you're not referring to, you're referring to the, the mental capital of going through this as opposed to the physical getting approved capital. No, I, I actually meant the actual, the investment of money that the community has put to this for me right now is a relatively new thing. It's a new investment. It's been a very big conversation in the community. So it does make sense to have one more year of procedures, infrastructure, safety drills, because it's all one thing, the capital, but then the operational stuff working together to get us where we need to be. So thank you. That's number three. You just stepped in it. That's exactly, I hate saying it that way, but that is what number three, I mean, number three specifically has the secure funding at town meeting for school town building security project. Complete $4.5 million approved at town meeting. I mean, that's. that's that goal I, though is on capital specifically. The other goal is more on safety, psychological safety, physical safety. It's, it's, it's a little bit different. It's more operational. Yeah. How, yeah. I see them as distinct. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Um, are we going on to other goals as well? 
I've, I've completed well, we're my in the questions. Yeah, I've absolutely. completed my presentation. Yeah. So, any questions you have on the, the goals? Yeah. Um, I actually had a suggestion on goal four. That I love. I love the goal. I think it's important. I think that it will be energizing for the conversations to happen about that. I think our world has changed, and our vision of the graduate is changing with it. Um, the people missing in your description are the students. I think that our high school students will have perspectives on what the vision of the graduate ought to be. And so I'd love to see you include them in that list of people that you're going to be talking to. And perhaps students the fourth. It says students in there. What? The design team included. includes students. We just didn't yeah, say the design students. team includes students. So I missed it. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. looking on page 11. Team, up here. Students will definitely be included. It's, go, why don't you just pop up four up there? It doesn't say it specifically. It says parents, educators, local officials. Students including. will definitely be included. We'll, we can have that. Right. Okay, I just I didn't that see wasn't, them. That wasn't an omission. We, that's an assumption. Okay. okay. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, and so um, with the three questions that you were talking to ask your stakeholders, I had a suggestion for a fourth when thinking about including the students. Um, so what are we currently, and it's, it's not to dictate, but just um, to think about it, what are we currently doing that supports your vision of our graduate, and what are we doing that distracts from your, from your vision? Just an idea for an additional question that might give important information. Sure. Yes. Um, I, I would support that additional question, and it's in the context of what should we start, what should we stop, what should we continue? So that's essentially the context of that co conversation. Um, just provides more of what are we doing well, what should we improve on, and what, sh what should we stop doing, because it's actually inhibiting. Um, so I, I'm. I agree with that that addition personally. Um, I would like, in some way, shape, or form, and maybe it's in the activities, a little bit more specificity of who and how many are in the design team. Now, we can't mandate that a certain number of volunteers sign up necessarily, but I think in kind of in alignment with the, the governing rules around, say, school councils, where you need a 50-50 mix or close to it, um, I think we need to have uh, a greater present uh, participation from the parent community, the, the outside community, than we had, for example, in our most recent larger study of early start or late start. Um, in that case, we had one parent, and maybe that was um, the only person who signed up, you know, things like that, so we can't mandate volunteers necessarily, but maybe even including things like specifically reaching to the school councils that exist already and see if anybody on those school councils would recommend a member of, the, of their, their body to attend on behalf. Um, I want to make sure that this includes, as it's already outlined, um, but again, as a lesson learned, uh, all levels of our schools. You, you list it here as pre-K to K, but I would even make sure that the action plan when you form the VOG design team specifically includes pre-K parents, K, you know, K to five parents, middle school parents, et cetera, as much as possible so we have the full, full gamut um, and the full input appropriately. So just to comment on that, um, there's a whole blueprint yeah. of how to run this process. And I think we need to even look beyond parents. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at Recent the business Recent sector. Recent we need to look at um, partners. partners. You, there's, a, there's a lot of partners, very similar to the, the Arcasa model, where you have different sectors that you want a part of this. Parents are one part of it. Yeah. but. We also have to expand, and the other. This is a group that's going to be doing a lot of research. They're going to do a lot of reading, watching a lot of videos. So this is a group that is going to be doing a lot of work. So commitment's going to be really important. Mm -hmm. So um, this isn't for the faint of heart, probably, be, <laughs> because 
they have to be drinking the Kool-Aid, shall we say, as to why we need to do this. Why do we, we te why do we need to change what we're doing? How do we have to prepare our kids differently for the future workforce? So that's why we need a much greater cross-section of people. I, I, I applaud that. I think that's, that's great. Um, I, I was going to go to the business community next, but you beat me to it. So I, I think that's awesome. If there's a way that we can distribute, um, either in the packet that there is um, that gets published afterwards or something else, mm -hmm. Um, you know that that guideline that rubric that whatever it is for how to build this team and what should be included in that team um, I would be for some way of distributing that sooner than later um, personally so yeah I mean that has to if we're gonna get a good chunk of this done so that we can use it as part of the evaluation we gotta get cracking on this yeah. yeah we have there's a timeline here yeah. uh, <laughs> not just the business I would I mean when you said the arcade I mean I think of the like the clergy is all yep involved. that's part of, yeah they, they outline a whole uh, blueprint on team. the members of what who should be on this help, vision help, of graduate team. Help. Yep. mental health yep. fields So you need to take some votes or not take any votes, but there's a couple of, so one vote you need to take is, are you using the new rubric? So I will move that the school committee move forward in the 2019, 2020 school year with the new rubric, just so we have one thing to vote on. Second. Any discussion? Moving forward with the rubric, does that mean we have to move forward with the six to eight, or can we move forward with the rubric separate from the six to eight? You can just move forward with the rubric. That was the elder and, question, sir. And then we determine at a later date the six to eight, or? you That's a choice that you as a committee, if you want to narrow it down to six to eight, that's up to you. So why don't we have that discussion next? First, are we gonna use the new rubric and then have a yeah. separate discussion on, are we gonna narrow the indicators? Yeah. Okay, hey, all those in favor? Six zero. Uh, I don't know whether we can actually have it, make a decision tonight on how many of the indicators uh, I'd like to. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. If you want me to go that route, I can recommend the eight that would make the most sense based on the district improvement plan goals, my own goals, things like that. And then you can. As a starting point. As a starting point, yeah. Date. So I can, for the, for the next meeting, I can do that. Just to share with the yeah. committee, my inclination is still not to narrow down. So I'll share that. Oh, but if okay. there are other, if that is not the consensus, then that's a good next step. So then if I just six, don't six to eight would be what, 15 to 20? Is that what, how many are there? Or I think there's 21. Like 20, right? Yeah, yeah. Six, if there wasn't an appetite on the committee to narrow down, I don't want Dr. Doherty wasting his time, is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'd actually like to see it narrowed to I'm inclined to go down, down the narrow step. Um, again, from the focus perspective, without the fight, the idea that you have to not look at anything else, right? But these are the primary areas that we're gonna look at. So the eight would be two per. I, yeah, I can, we can start that, if that makes sense, and we can go from there. I can recommend two per. No, you don't have to vote on that. All right. Uh, what else did we want to do? We want to vote on the uh, district or the uh, the goal, the district improvement plan, or yeah, that's it. 
point of clarification? Yes. If we don't vote on it now and we wait for, say, those, those are his personal ones, but, you know, they're very closely tied, right? So if we don't vote on it now, when's, what's our next discussion and what's the negative ramifications of not voting today versus on voting what? next? Uh -huh. On the district improvement oh, plan and his personal goals, if we were to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearkening back to July, right? When we had the conversation where we said, <coughs> you know, we wanted to have more than one meeting on this particular topic because it was so important. All right, so um, I'll, I'll clarify. Uh, we then met, or we met uh, with uh, Gail and. I. Gail and and Chris. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Point next. Wait, wait. Whatever you need. Oh, I was there. trying to think about what I, what I wanted to do. Okay, so, <laughs> believe me, I know who you are. <laughs> so, that doesn't mean he knows the name of <laughs> uh, And we, then when we, we cut it down to uh, a one year plan as opposed to going into another three year, we did uh, agree that we would reconvene and whether it be a retreat type format in the in the spring to collaboratively talk about the the three year district improvement plan. But this one had to be put together quickly in terms of you know, we're already into you know, November now. Just so you know, this is when you normally approve it each year. So you're not, in fact, you're three days earlier than normal. But I think, yeah. but yeah. I think Mr. Robinson's point, Mr. Wise's point is a good one, which is typically the school committee would have some input early on. The challenge this year was the leave of absence. Hence the one year goals, not three year goals. I, Go ahead. I mean, I think that's a fair point. Um, I think we've obviously had a good amount of discussion but we've made no changes, really, right? So we haven't seen a, a red line version of it or anything else from the conversations. So my perspective of, of this right now is, I think it's a, a phenomenal start. Well, we don't have to vote on it tonight. Not, yeah, we do. From my perspective, it's not ready to be voted on, but I'm just I'm just one person. I guess yeah. you asked about negative ramifications. I mean, it's November. So I'm, I, if we put off the vote, we put off the vote, but we need to move quickly. I mean, the district, I don't want to be approving the one-year plan in January <laughs> when the year is half over. <laughs> well, I would also add that we have heard nothing about the school improvement plans. It's a district improvement plan, informed school improvement plans, but school improvement plans theoretically are providing feedback to the district improvement plan, too. We haven't heard anything about any of the school improvement plans. So we're just saying, okay, here's the district improvement plan, but yet there's eight schools on County Rise that theoretically have a school improvement plan that we should be looking at as well. And, you know, there is, it's a symbiotic relationship, so I would expect them to be highly aligned, but it's possible that something else is coming out of the schools that we may not see here necessarily. Um, or there may be something, you know, because most of those teams are just really reformed in early September, and may, many of them just had their first meeting in the beginning of October. So have they had a chance as a collective body, not as a single principal, but as a collective body, to provide the feedback into what the school improvement plan is, to then provide feedback into, hey, we, you know, we're really interested in this that might tie back the district improvement plan. And I don't, my, we haven't seen that. Dr. Dorn. So I'll talk about the practice that we've done over the last several years on this committee, is that I'm the one that sits down with each principal, which I've been doing. So the goal process ends at the end of October, just so you know, that's part of the normal. So teachers are doing their goals right now, principals are doing their goals with me, um, and you are doing your goals, I'm doing my goals with you. So that is part of the normal timeline. So you are right on schedule with the normal timeline. The school improvement plans, I'm the one that's always been reviewing those as part of the goal setting process for the principals. They are following the same template that we are following. They have been very involved in the development of the district improvement plan. They have been working with their school councils 
since September developing their school improvement plans, and I've seen several of them. I'm about halfway through my goals meetings. So I've seen several of the school improvement plans, and they are all aligned with what is in the current district, imp the district improvement plan that you have in front of you. Yes. I'm comfortable with supporting this district improvement plan. Um, I feel like we've had this conversation. There might be tweaks. I'm wondering if we can, as part of our motion, say that they incorporate some of what they've heard. I, I'm not sure what the rule, how much leeway we can give with a vote, but I'd love for them to get going. I mean, I think they already are doing it, but. I feel comfortable with what they have here and that we've been able to contribute to it in our, in our questions and reflections. And that it's been a team process with the other schools and principals. Yes. I mean, again, I'm just one person, but if you read the Mass General Law, it says the superintendent shall review and approve the plan after consultation with the school committee. It's black and white, right? And consulting doesn't mean that we can overwrite or we can change it or anything else along those lines, but our obligation and his obligation, Dr. Doherty, you know this as well, is to consult with us on those school improvement plans, right? And it has not been happening, and no, it hasn't, it right? Not in public session, at least, right? Um, so to say that we should just go ahead and say approve this without having had that consultation means we're giving up some of our well, obligation, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, it is what Mass General Law 7159C says, and also what Mass General Law 691I says. Right? 691I is even a little bit stronger. You know, submitted to this, it's the same thing, after consultation with the school committee. Um, so again, there's consultation point there that is not, has not happened. There's a bit of delegation that's happened, and that's fine if everybody's comfortable with that. I, and I'm sure they will be well aligned, like I said, but I think there is a point that we have the statutory responsibility and the statutory authority to be consulted for the school improvement plans. If I may, by approving the district approval plan, you are providing the consultation. Because as part of my goal setting process with all the principals, they have to align their school improvement plans with the district improvement plan. That has always been one of my uh, mandates, I guess. Is so what's, what do you and have? The school improvement plans will not be ready for school council approvals until late November. I gave them the extra time this year because we started this whole process later. And school councils only meet once a month. And so by, approve, yeah. so by approving these tonight, we're essentially setting you up to go to the school councils and say the district improvement plan has been set, the school committee's approved it, now it needs to be aligned to this. Yep. If we don't do that and say, well, we want to see your school improvement plans first, then it's, I imagine they're still going to align to this, assuming this is true. I mean, I'm just, I can see the validity to approving the district improvement plan and then the school improvement plans being built into that. that that makes logical That's sense. That's the coherence me. piece that I was referring to as one of the, my responsibilities as a superintendent. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So then how much um, back and forth happens with the schools towards the district improvement plan? So do the schools, I, I don't wanna use the word, no, I'm not gonna use those words. So do the schools contribute to what the district improvement plan, and you've already spoken with the principals about the district improvement we've plan. We've met several right? times. So they were a few times during the summer, and we've met since I've been back. We've met two other times and really fine tuned it to what you see here. So, my question is Are the schools missing an opportunity to change the district improvement plan if we vote? to support this? No, because they're all aligned. So, but they're not voted yet. No, but what the drafts that I've seen are aligned. To our draft. To our draft. Okay. 
So. And, and that's the way we've done business for several years now. This is, we've always made sure that our, that schools are not going in different directions. It used to be that way many years ago, but we, we have made a conscious effort to make sure that our schools are all aligned. Okay. Then, then I'm comfortable with supporting this district improvement plan now. So just as a note, right, I mean, due to that question, I, have, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate the school alignment. Right, we want, we want Joshua Eaton and Killam and Woodend and all our elementary schools doing generally the same thing. Um, but that said, historically, school councils have not had the ability to make changes to school improvement plans. They haven't. It's come in in the beginning of September, teachers sit down, parents sit down, and I'm getting nods over there because there's, there's agreement. It's done. By law, that's not supposed to be what's happening. The school improvement plan is supposed to be a consultative effort between the parents, the teachers, and the principal. But right now it's coming in and it's written. And this has been going on for years, right? As, as, as a Josh Wheaton task force member, don't shake your head. Well, I'm, from my experience having been on many, many school councils, that's not the experience I had. We absolutely contributed to the school improvement plans. So that's why you were. There may be segments of the population in which that's the case. But in many cases, it's not the case. And it has not been the case in, in for quite some time. It, it is supposed to be a consultative process where the, the, the parents and the teachers of that school can contribute to it. Yes, there needs to be alignment. I'm fully in agreement with the alignment. But there are certain cases at schools that are specific to those schools that parents are not able to get onto the improvement plan because it's done, right? So part of this is me also objecting to that process because it does not align with what the, what the law says is supposed to happen. But part of it is we have an authority that we're supposed to execute. And by, not, by approving the district improvement plan without having had the consultation, unless we say, you know what, okay, we'll approve it, but we are going to have a consultation on the school improvement plans because that is our obligation by law, right? It's ours then we're not, we're not allowing for that process. We're not allowing for the feedback process that is supposed to exist in the school councils. And I know it's not the case. I have many parents that are on school councils that have told me it's not the case now in certain places. I, as Dr. Doherty just said a few minutes ago, uh, the, they're not going to be done until the end of November, right? Correct. And, and that's just because we started later? or they started later, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, approving this, but getting a, uh, some type of report when they do, when they are done uh, sometime in December. Uh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely no that, problem. We've done that in the past. They, were, they, we yeah. put the, we put them in the or, I mean, or, or do we, are you suggesting we don't vote on these until after no, the end of November? Or? I'm, I mean, I'm suggesting that it's, it's a collaborative process across the two. One informs the other, the other informs the first, right? I mean, it's, it's a selective process. I mean, it's a process that goes together. Um, if, the, if the rest of the body wants to vote to approve, so be it. I mean, it's five to one in that case. I don't think we've seen what we need to see and I don't think they're written in a specific nature enough to align to SMART goals or anything else along those lines that we should be approving them today. I think there was a lot of feedback that this body had on them that I don't think we can provide enough specificity in the motion that would actually see them update appropriately to the conversation. So from my perspective, I don't think we've seen our statutory stuff of the school improvement plan. And I think while they're, they're, very, they're an excellent start, they don't include our feedback as, they, as we've heard through tonight. So my perspective is we should not be voting on them. Whether it's November 7th, whether we set a meeting the 1st of December, whatever it is, I, you know, I'm not saying what that is. Um, I would say to your request that if we do get a report at a later point in time, that we hear from both the school lead and the, and the parent lead of each, of each school. And that we're hearing, for, for a better way to say it, that they're all they're aligned and they they had the process that they that they should have had. Um, that's my perspective. Again, I'm just one person, um, but I think if we're going to get those reports, they should be joint reports, 
and both parties' leadership should agree to that joint report. Okay. Yes. Um, so you've raised a number of very serious concerns tonight. One of one, the one that is resonating in my head is a challenge to our adherence to the law. But we have an attorney. We have an attorney who can help us figure that out. So my suggestion is that the chair and I maybe take offline a question of is the current process following applicable law and report back to the committee because um, all due respect, you're not an attorney. So I think we should be getting legal advice from our legal advisors. So let's take that question as a, like as a, um, I think we need to look into that because it's a serious allegation. So let's look into that offline. Um, the second, is that a discrepancy about what's happening at various schools in terms of the process being followed by school councils, since that process is, I believe, led by the principal, right? It's a co-chair. The they're co-chaired. Co-chaired, but to the extent that it, it feels like your allegation is very close to a personnel complaint, that something is not happening at one or more schools no. that should be happening, and that feels like that should be discussed with the principal specifically. I'd well, not with the principal. It actually should be discussed with me since I'm the one that That's what I meant. Yeah, <laughs> that is absolutely what I meant. Yeah. That if you have a complaint about how a staff member is performing a part of their function, that's a conversation with Dr. Doherty for him to oversee. Um, and then I, I, I hear what you're saying about the collaborative. I'm so sorry, Dr. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as the collaborative nature, I, I hear the value in that process. I'm struggling to see the the workability of it. I mean, if we have a district improvement plan, it makes sense to me that the, the schools are given the district improvement plan as a basis for building theirs. So if they come back and say, well, we want to do something completely different, and we say, oh, well, that's a good idea. Let's, we could be doing this for six months, and it's only a one-year plan. So I, I hear that I like the idea of it being very collaborative, but I just think in practice they need some guidance about what are the big goals that the district has to build from which isn't to say they can't add in a goal or two that are specific to their school. Mr. Park. I'd actually like to make a motion to table this to the November 7th meeting so that we can get the legal questions answered that we need to have answered, as well as get some updates in here that have been suggested by the committees. Table what? We did, there's nothing the to table. The district improvement plan. The well, approval. We dis you, you table a motion that we yeah. haven't made a motion. So Oops, sorry. Not, <laughs> no, and you mean we, we dis continue the discussion? Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Uh, Can you make a comment? Yeah. So this was brought to my attention last June about the law by Mr. Wise. I called Desi. I got a hold of the associate commissioner. <coughs> I gave them the questions and said, this is what the law says. There was a couple of things about dates, too, because the law also says June 1st, which is not realistic. There is no way you can have schools, have a district, have a school improvement June 1st done. or July 1st? July. Uh, July 1st, sorry. There's no way, it's not realistic for everything that's going on in a school the last three months of a school year to have a school improvement plan completed when you don't even have your MCAS scores yet for, for the next year, which is usually a big part of the, what's going on in the current. So I asked Essie, I said, can you give us some guidance? Because the law makes no sense. I'm the one that supervises all the building principals. I'm the one that evaluates them based on their school improvement plans. They told me that they have a memo that was going to Desi Legal that Desi Legal has been reviewing for months that clarified what the roles were. So I've not heard anything else. I don't think our legal counsel is going to be able to help us on this because Desi doesn't even have a firm idea of this. The law is convoluted. One so that's why the committee, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yep, to. Nope. That's why the committee several years ago we went through this, we went with this approach where we gave schools a little bit more time in the fall to do it right, to put in the time and effort once they got more data. Um, and this year was very helpful, last year, because we had the pride survey results, we had the MCAS, all of that. So they were able to
to put together some really good plans. Um, I want to go back to something I said earlier about empowerment. We need to empower our principals to do the jobs they need, they've been hired to do. The current group of principals I have are excellent. If there's been a reference made to past principals with school councils, I accept that because I, I have had those conversations with principals that are no longer here. But the current group, we have to trust the job that they're doing. They are doing good work. It is starting to show. We are gaining momentum. When we start micromanaging this process, that's when problems are going to start happening. So that's my two cents worth on this. Just one more point, and then I'll be quiet. Yep. All right. Um, this law changed specifically on November 30th, 2016, specifically to add the consultation with school committee. That was the addition. If you go look at the MGL, you can see this was removed, this was added, November 30th, 2016. So if we were previously not following the consultative, we weren't breaking the law, right, or not agreeing with the law. I agree with Dr. Doherty about July 1st. I think it's, it's somewhat unattainable. And in that conversation, I also asked, is there something we can do to lobby with Jason Lewis or Rich Haggerty or anybody else that says, let's put a realistic date in there, November 30th, November 1st, something, you know, even if it's November 1st, it aligns almost to the exact process that we generally execute, right? Um, but it does say, and it was specifically added three years ago, consultation with the school committee. It's black and white, and I can show it to you. It's, I mean, if she wants to review it, by all means, I think she should. But it does say consultation with the school committee. Now, in that conversation, we also had a conversation to that end. He said, well, you know, I talked to the, uh, the DESE, and this, they said, you know, I think it was, I actually had referred to a regulation website at the point in time, which was eight years old, right? And they agreed, and we both agreed, that it was out of date and not accurate. And DESE did, too. Um, but the conversation then turned to consultation with the school committee. And the statement at the time was, okay, I can, you could consult with me, but I can ignore you at that consultation. Well, that's fine, you can do that. I'm not opposed to that necessarily. I'm just saying we as a group are supposed to be consulted on these things, and it is an input to this process. So, you know, I, letter to law, whatever you want to say it, you know, if Nick were here, he would say shall, right? I mean. <laughs> You want to use the, the lawyer-related stuff. It does say what it does say. So, Dr. Doherty, did you get enough feedback tonight uh, where you could uh, redline or, uh, you know, the district improvement or, you know, update it based on that and we could vote on it at another the next meeting or not? I, the biggest takeaway I heard is that some of the outcomes – Word specific, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Coming up with arbitrary numbers, I'm not sure. I could put down 2%, I could put down 5%. I'm not sure what that is going to accomplish. I can certainly do that. I, I think it's a dangerous road when we start going into that specificity on, on measurable outcomes for certain areas. In one year. In, one, in year. one year. Yeah. I, I can certainly do it. I would not be able to back up where I got those numbers from. Okay. Yeah, just one other point on that. I think where we ended that conversation was if we don't want to agree to a percentage, which I'm fine with, it's the methodology. As measured by doing X, what is the methodology, right? What are you comfortable with from a methodology perspective? What are you and your staff comfortable with, right? Are you looking at cohorts from year to year and there's a gap closing from that? Are you looking from, you know, testing year to year to year and there's a gap closing from that? Are you looking at both of those? Are you looking from, you know, third, you know, what the gap was when they were in third grade to what the gap was when they were in sixth grade? You know, how are we going to look at that? I think the methodology is a fair question, if not the percentage. So we're at least saying we're in the same orchard. We're all looking at apples, not apples, bananas, oranges, and everything else. Um, you know, if there's a way we can come up with crafting language around that, that would help guide our process of review, 
then I would hope we can do that. But that's that's my request in that particular case. Without, what's the committee's pleasure in terms of voting tonight or, or not? I would say no. I feel like there's a lot of questions, but I also I'm feeling the time pressure too. Like let's get this year underway. Um, maybe it's because my term's shorter, but <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, I feel like. Um, well, yeah, I mean, when I say to, move it, it would be to uh, a week what? from Thursday, right? Yeah, is that right? Yes. 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 Mike. Dr. Doc. My concern is that if we move it. And then we have another lengthy conversation like this. Next week is very full with a very important presentation on the enrollment study results and, and recommendations. We have a full docket. I think this is, I'm not undermining how important this is. I feel comfortable with this and I feel comfortable with the process if we're going to have an update on the school improvement plans, and as Mrs. Borowski said, that it's a, a cycle, so we will be hearing from them. I have to say also, my experience is a little dated, um, and barring when we had an issue at the high school in the past, I was on the school council at Killam, I was on the school council at Coolidge, both of them for many years, I was on the, the council at RMHS, for many years before the problem happened. And in those, we always contributed to the school improvement plan, but there were always also people that felt that they didn't because what they wanted to happen didn't or wasn't integrated. And I, I just want to be careful about that. Um, and that if they're, to repeat what was said, if there is an issue, then they should go to the superintendent and report that. That's not our purview to oversee the school councils. So um, I, I would like, I, I believe what's said about the DSE. I also remember reading that the dates of the um, school improvement, the district improvement plan, school, sorry, school improvement plan could be shifted with a request. And it sounds like the request had happened that's the new, that's the funding law that hasn't been passed yet. That's what you're referring to. Because there's that accountability component. Oh, maybe, okay. Yeah. Read too much. That's the piece that, <laughs> the, yeah, that's still Sorry. Isn't approved yet. Okay. So I feel comfortable with the process knowing that we will know about the school improvement plans as well and that Dr. Doherty is working closely with, has already worked not just Dr. Doherty, the team has worked closely with the principals. And that's how this has evolved. So that's, that's where I stand. Yeah, I'm actually ready to vote tonight too. Um, I'd like to put some pressure on Desi to get some guidance on this regulation. It does sound like the law is murky and I would like some clarity on that. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned about this just dragging on for weeks and months. I don't think it's fair to our principals. Oh, oh yeah, Jeff, Dr. Corm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with the last points that we don't want this to drag on. We need to get something down, something fixed. You know, maybe you come back and revote it later, but have something down and make sure that the school committees, uh, school councils see that, that yes, the school committee voted on this. We want to be aligned with it. And, and that's where we are. Um, come back at, at, to it later, but you know we're well into this one year for the one-year plan. So I think you really need to vote it tonight and get it off your agenda for future meetings. Yes. Maybe. Oh, there is no one. There is no one. Um, there is no one. Oh, there is one. Sorry. 
um, <laughs> move <laughs> to <laughs> accept uh -huh. the 2019-2020 um, district improvement plan as presented. I'll second that. All those in favor? Opposed? Five, one. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, can we have a short recess? Yeah, I, I was gonna actually propose that we do the social media on the 7th. Is that, which would well, well, effectively was, end the meeting, uh, but that's, go ahead, go ahead. No, that's, that's fine, uh, I, that's fine. And the brochure as well is being put off. That, that's, I'm putting that out there, it's 10.30. Now we're close to 10 yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. 10 18. That's fine. Then you just answer my question. I was just going to make a motion that we postpone discussion of the social media and the uh, brochure until a future meeting mm -hmm. and that we brochure adjourn. Brochure into meeting. infinity. <laughs> <laughs> social media. I don't agree <laughs> with that. <laughs> I'm only nope. being a lot of I know. The, I, know. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> the, no, yes, for the seventh. Okay. Point um, of clarification. It, yes. Or we haven't, do we need to, we voted on the district improvement plan. We have oh, not so voted oh, on the superintendent vote goals. goals. Thank you, Mr. Wise. <laughs> I rescind uh, my um, motion. I have a different motion. Thank I mean, you, Mr. Wise. We could have closed Weiss. without that and yeah. I might have been happy, but. <laughs> It's Move. probably not the right thing or the fair thing to do. No. Move to approve Dr. Doherty's um, goals for the 2019-2020 school year as presented. A second. Any discussion? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wise. Did you, did you? you know, I mean, I, my, my objection is the same objection, but, you know, it is what it is. All those in favor? Opposed? Five, one. One more motion? Yeah. Move to adjourn. Kick, before you do that, Pardon. can I? Yes, Mr. Corm. Dr. Corm, I'm sorry. Regarding the social media policy, I, there was supposed to be a first reading tonight, and I don't know whether you want to or whether you have the ability to read it so that, you know, you've done your first reading and postpone discussion until a later at the second reading, just so you don't have to push it off to a second meeting. I, I don't know whether you no, want to I, do it. I, I, can, I, I had thought about that. Uh, Oops, saw the comment. In terms of read, the first reading is, isn't is just with no comment. Because right. uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, a lengthy discussion. It is. Um, to that point, at the very end of that adjournment, I think I heard you say until November 7th, and I don't think. No, I thought that is when's, what's November next? November, next is November, November 7th. 7th. Is the next, but I'm not sure that that long discussion should happen, the social media should happen on November 7th, because that's going to be I a just, very let me, I, let me put it there as a placeholder, and I'll have to look at the calendar, and if it's not appropriate, we'll either put I'm another. I'm with that meeting on the calendar or find an, yeah, I, I know there's another big, big issue that, or big topic. Elementary that space. Mr. Robinson, to that point, yeah. we have added December 12th, I believe. I think it's on there, right? Yep, on guidance there. presentation. So there is a, this, we've is that already, the one that we, we, we talked, moved the high school guidance didn't. presentation. It was supposed to be November 7th to December 12th. So we've added a meeting on December 12th. All right, that's right. We talked about yep, that, we did. but I didn't know we, We'll figure out the. Okay. So is the motion, I guess, passed to push these out? I don't think we voted. No. The, we didn't the have a. We didn't have you, a motion. You control the agenda. Just items. decided That's the it. Unless, by policy, we need to vote to change the agenda. So that's what we're doing, right? We're taking these things off the agenda. We can't just technically can't change the order, can't change the agenda that's been published. We have to vote to that we're changing the agenda to say that it's going to be pushed to, the, to a future meeting. We don't have to decide what meeting necessarily, but technically we've got to vote that it's pushed to a different meeting. To vote to table the agenda items. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have no, we haven't. No. Move to table. Yeah. 
the um, agenda item scheduled for this evening for the school committee brochure and first reading of policy BHESM social media. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? <laughs> Six zero. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> All those <laughs> Thank you. In favor. <laughs> Thank you.